Hello, friends. Hello. I'm here with my friend, Gray Waste Tim. Hey, Tim. How's it going? Hello. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited for this one. Oh, yeah. We've been... Um, this is a stream we've been kicking around the idea for for a while. We're going to try to drill down to the origins of Shy, which um, I'm pretty sure it's pronounced like a sigh. It's a warning against supposed superfruits. Thank you, Daniel Dibka. Someone else... Before I hit, before we started, somebody was like, no streamer, no rules. Kyle Drogo's Nissa Nissa. Actually, actually, Kyle Drogo <laughs> was Nissa Nissa in the pyre. Um, he, <laughs> he was. Uh, the, Danny and Drogo both do the Azor High and Nissa Nissa thing. They're kind of role switching. Danny takes the torch and inserts it into Drogo's pyre. So she's doing the male role. Uh, whereas Drogo is the sacrifice there. So, yeah. But that's because the sun and the moon kill each other during the long night. Uh, already off track, Tim. Already off track. So, origins of a shy. <laughs> we are going to try... There's a lot of questions we're going to try to answer today. One, the big question, kind of, is what is the intersection of the Deep Ones and the Great Empire of the Dawn? Um, when we ask who built a shy... We basically have two mm -hmm. good answers, two hypotheses that may be the same hypotheses, according to Tim. The two ideas that we have are that the Great Empire of the Dawn built a shy uh, before it was all turned dark and corrupt. And then when the long night happened, it was all transformed into Orly Blackstone. So not built out of this weird, corrupt stone, but rather built like a normal city and then transformed. Or... If it was built out of oily stone, then really the only people that could have done that would be the deep ones. Because we're talking about something that's so, like, this is a fantasy thing that we're not supposed to fathom. It's supposed to be so weird and impressive that we're just in awe of it. Like, who could build the largest city in the world out of toxic black stone? The fucking deep ones. Okay? So... These are always these have always been the two ideas. Um, people are complaining about a choppy feed. I don't know what to tell you about that. Um, everything looks okay on my end. Chops ahoy. Well, sometimes it's just a little internet weirdness. Maybe it'll it'll work itself out. Let me just check my modem here. Mine's Says I have a good connection, Tim. We'll just have to hope it sorts out. In any case, we're going to try to figure out who built a shy, and if the Deep Ones and the Great Empire of the Dawn have any correlation or intersection. Uh, but we're also going to answer a few other questions. We're going to get into Lang and the Old Ones and the Green Men and the Great Empire of the Dawn's colonization of Westeros. Who was the Grey King? Who was Garth the Green? Um, stuff like that. And uh, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you've watched um, my Secret Origins of the Green Men series, you'll be in good shape. We will give a little bit of background um, for those of you who maybe haven't, aren't schooled up on all the lore. But basically, this is deep world building here. And this is going to be a great example of something that makes me feel very confident in some of my theories which is basically that multiple lines of uh, investigation lead to the same place, okay? So, for example, I'm going to explain this uh, in summary form, but I figured out that the old ones on Lang must be green men by looking at metatextual clues from inside the books, having no idea that in Lovecraft world, there are horny goat people on a place called Lang. So it's like, you can, you can not know anything about Lovecraft and just follow the clues in the books about the old ones and figure out that they're green men. Or at least I, I can. I did. I don't know that anyone else did, but I'm, I'm <laughs> wacky enough to have put that together. Uh, and then you look at the Lovecraft influence and it confirms that, yes, people on Lang should be horned goat humans or something like that. <laughs> so... We're going to do more of that today with the King in Yellow. You've heard Tim talk about the King in Yellow before. Hopefully you subscribe to Tim's channel, Grey Waste Tim, and you're familiar with the uh, King in Yellow, but it's a major figure, 
not only from Lovecraft, but from a couple other authors that Lovecraft borrowed from. And he tells us a lot about Euron and a few other things. And oh, the chat is, is stuck. Let's, let's figure that out. There we go. Thank you, Swinny the Pooh. I think ExxonMobil built a shy, explains the oily black stone. That's not a bad theory. That's, that's what they've been <laughs> doing with all the toxic you know, oil sludge and stuff that they can't uh, just dump into the sea. They, they figured out how to turn it into cyclopean blocks. And uh, this is all post, post-apocalyptic, Tim. Preston Jacobs was right. Red Comet is a spaceship. And there's no magic. It's all technology. Sorry, that's not very much of a good segue to hand hand to you. Um. Oh. Okay, well, <laughs> all right, so, so I guess let's just hop straight into it. Origins of a shy. So, yeah, we're looking at this from two different aspects. One, that it was built by humans, being the Great Empire, or second, that, and it's, and it, uh, the blighting, the black stone came later. Or two, that it was built by squishers and it's always been made of black stone. Now, I'm going with, I mean, there could be a mix, but the fact that a shy is so huge that it's big enough to hold Volantis, Karth, King's Landing, and Old Town means that it had to have been a very important city back during the peak of the Great Empire. And that is why, like you have theorized, and it's one that I agree with, is that Ashai may have been the capital of the Great Empire. And it makes sense. It's a lo- huge city, port city, control of the Saffron Straits, huge trading route, uh, the gates to east and west for the empire at that point. So, yeah, the idea that Ashai was some kind of capital or at the very least one, some major metropolis for the great empire makes a lot of sense. And if we go with that idea, then it seems like the blighting, it turning into oily black stone and the de- all the decay and toxicity that's now surrounding it is something that came later that originally it was your your run of the mill Rome, uh Beijing, your the the golden the golden city of an empire that we think of. Yeah, because there are major Atlantis vibes from the Great Empire of the Dawn. And so you're looking, you know, who builds the biggest city in the world? Well, possibly the greatest, largest empire that was in the ancient world. Mm -hmm. That would kind of make sense. And it really does, the picture does fit well with the Saffron Straits and all that stuff. And let me actually, um, I've got a bunch of art here, so let me pop open my Ashai folder. Lovely Ashai by the shadow. Lovely place. Just the vibe is strong. This is Renee Agner, of course, here. This is Marco Ayazi. I like how both of these have ships sailing there. It gives, it sort of brings you, the viewer, to into the picture, and you imagine yourself on this lonely ship, and you're approaching these black cliffs all this fog and weird darkness and the light doesn't look right and the fire there's like little you know little torches and stuff in the doorways and you're just like oh my god was this a mistake to come here at all i heard there was gold to be had here and yeah i I want a spell to save my auntie but maybe this maybe the price is too high look at this place no it is vibey though and um this one is by Jovan Delic here. And you can see the shadow binder skulking around and the green phosphorescence of the river ash. So, yeah, it's just, you know, we're told that the population of Ashai now is small. It's like one tenth mm-hmm. or one twentieth its capacity. So basically it's a bunch of dark sorcerers from various cults. You know, there's, a, there's actually a temple of R'hllor in a shy and obviously there's shadow binders and every kind of magician that you could think of goes there to study it's very likely that it's a hinge of the world and this artwork here by the way is by sven sauer very cool imagining the uh sort of a, a pit that goes down into the earth um so it, it's very likely that a shy is a hinge of the world right tim just like the wall like i mean you'd 
if any place besides the wall is also a hinge of the world. And Melisandre says, one of the hinges of the world. It's got to be a shy. Mm-hmm. And she says, my magic will be stronger here, even then at a shy. So it sounds like she's saying the wall is similar to a shy, but even more powerful, right? Yeah. And it makes you think like, well, if, if this is one of the hinges and the wall is the second hinge, or yeah, that a shy is a second hinge just as the wall is, then how many more are there? Are there more than two? Like what's, what are the other ones we're missing then? Yeah, I could think of a couple others, you know, Isle of Faces could definitely be one, Old Town, Valyria, you know, yeah. there's some definitely some places that you think of. Um, Harrison Grand Williams asks, is it possible that the Starship hypothesis is true and that the city was, in fact, built on rock and roll? Um, and Kolnitsky <laughs> piped in to say that, I'm oversimplifying, Preston didn't say it's all technology. Um, I am, I am sort of, that's, you guys, like, look, I like Preston Jacobs. I watched some of his videos. So this, take it as a, as a ball busting. I know I'm oversimplifying. He has explored that territory. But yeah, that's not exactly. The, obviously, if someone summarized my mood media theory in one sentence, you know, I, it wouldn't be a good representation of it. But yeah, it's, it's all love here. It's all love. So, um, all right. So that's the basics about a shy. So there's a shadow that hangs over the entire city. Uh, let's see here. This one is by Jovan Delich. These are actually, there's a shy on the left and Stygi on the right. And we'll talk about Stygi too. But basically there's a shadow that hangs over this entire area. It looks like it hangs over the entire peninsula, really. Um, so it could just be the city, but it's probably the whole thing. We know nothing grows on that whole peninsula except for ghost grass, children and animals don't seem to do well there. It says that children aren't found there and animals, you mm-hmm. know, aren't found there either. One assumes that like the toxic magic of the place probably takes a toll on any human that isn't a magician. So perhaps children and animals are more vulnerable to it. Uh, but it's not the kind of place you want to hang out for a real long time. For all intents and purposes, it is the magical version of a fallout zone, just like the doom of Valeria. And that's why some people even go so far as to wonder, like, oh, maybe this is post-apocalyptic fantasy fiction and this is a fallout zone. But I think it's just a magic version of that. There's magical toxicity. Again, it's very similar to Valeria. Valeria is just more recent. So in 8,000 years, dark sorcerers will probably go to the ruins of Valeria and try to harness that hinge of the world magic and you know, study dark magic there. Like, mm-hmm. that's how I see a shy. Um, yeah, so there's a... Ghost grass grows there, and a ghost grass is weird. It's not a normal plant. You know, it glows in the dark with the souls of the damned, and it looks like milk glass, and it's six feet tall. It's really weird. Um, there is a lot of gold and gems in abundance. So that, again, lends itself to the idea along with the saffron straits this was once a wealthy rich peninsula a good place to live which is why you'd build a huge city there and that it controlled these valuable uh, straits which you know were probably important for trade which implies there are lands further east of ashai uh, to trade with also Mm -hmm. yeah um because like when well, well, I has no children, we also got to remember like George has been asked directly about this. And his answer was, well, who said that? Because it's the maesters that we're gonna, like George is writing from the perspective of maesters. Like he's not using word of God logic a lot of the time. And he even explains this is like a German monk who's probably never, never left his little hamlet, but he's going to tell you about Cambodia, right? He doesn't know what he's talking about. So when a maester is saying, so when it's the maester saying that there are no children from a shy, that's because they're, what they're getting is they're getting secondhand information from other people that have, cl- that have been there or claim to have been there. And, but they, but then George also reminds us time and time again, that sailors are a very superstitious people. And usually the people that are coming back from a shy to Westeros are people who are sailing. They're going to a shy to try and make their fortune by selling simple 
things like food and water for gemstones and gold. Yep. So that is that is what it is now. Um, and yeah, it's it's just a matter of unpacking it to to that like was it always messed up like this or did it become messed up? So you can sort of see what's going on here. Um, and we're gonna talk about the layout in a minute. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the stuff we're gonna do is we're gonna be drawing from the Lovecraft parallels to try to explain what is going on here. And this is a point I wanna make. One of the reasons why George uses all these references to Tolkien and Lovecraft is because it saves him time. <laughs> World building, mm -hmm. okay? By putting all these Numenorean parallels to the Danes, it helps us figure out that the Danes are part of the Great Empire of the Dawn. Um, putting the Lovecraft yeah. parallels to some of these characters like Euron is going to give us a clue about what's going on with Euron. And the same with Ashai. We don't have much information about Ashai. Like Tim said, everything we do have is meant to be foggy and rumors and exaggerations and stuff. Um, but somewhere down in there is the truth. And it does yeah. seem to be a messed up place. Uh, so talk about Stygi for a second. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I was just say, well, Stygi is a good, is a good place to go to with this idea that I'm going to give. I do think that the simple answer is that it wasn't always messed up like that because even with both ideas of how a shy was built, whether it was built by great empire humans or whether it was built by deep ones to build a city that massive, but have it be in a place where, you can't maximize the amount of people living there makes no sense. So it had to have been normal at one point, because even if squishers built it, their whole point is human farming. They wouldn't want to build, waste their efforts building a city in order where people can't live. That's counterintuitive. They need people to farm. They want as many people living there as possible. So I, I think the simple answer is that a shy was once normal and this whole blighting came later, and it's probably an after effect of uh, a something like a meteor strike, and then the ensuing great, the ensuing long night. Um, because and Tim, the color, the color out of the, great the color out of space really, to me, clinched this. So can you can you weave that into your narrative here, real quick? Yeah. So when we think of like. Uh, the great empire. Like one of the things I think that a lot of people don't really do is actually try and look at the great empire as functionally as an empire and look at the things that happen when an empire falls. So when you have a catastrophic event, like a meteor strike, something like, the, and if it's a meteor, like the one from color out of space, where not only are you getting the, all of the normal effects that you would get from a meteor impact, the the debris the dust the debris all the ecological and environmental effects that are come from that but then you also it also turns out this also is a supernatural meteor that's also leaching the life out of things that's going to create a whole host of problems but we can draw now that fantastic element aside we can look at the downfall of real world empires so all my all my social studies fans history political <laughs> science geography peeps you're you if you you've studied you, if you know these things like you can kind of see where i'm going here this the long night becomes the moment that kills the great empire there is no emperor after the bloodstone emperor right this is it rome has been sacked constantinople has been taken alexander takes his last breath and says to the strongest it's like this is it this is what kills it and then what you have in the aftermath is the rise of successor states that's how we get yt and the Shadowlands, and Nefer, and Lang, and, Lang, and then Herkun, all of them. And, yeah, all the rest. Yeah, Ashramoni Marku. And they all have their own cultural Azor Ahai-like figure. That's how Yintar, Nefarion, Herkun, the hero. These are all these are all people that have were once part of this great empire, now trying to claim a new Nash, type of national identity in the aftermath of a catastrophic event because when an empire falls like the land is still there people flee but people will, but other people will stay and try to make the best of what comes afterwards so a shy is like the aftermath of that is what happens when the capital of your once great empire 
falls and is ruined, you deal with the aftermath. People leave. That's why you see such a huge population decline. But some people stay and they try to live on. So the color out of space, important to point out, the movie was pretty cheesy and not necessarily the great representation of the book. Um, the color, the idea is that the meteorite is a color that is sort of like a shifty, um, what's the word, uh, like on a grease puddle, the iridescence that's on the top. That's called, uh, that's another word besides iridescence. For that. <laughs> Oleaginous. I thought, I don't know if that's it. Um, but Luminous? yeah, th the point is, it's supposed to be a shifting, weird color that's indescribable. So describing something as oily black stone is very likely mm -hmm. like, yeah, it is supposed to be oily colored. So that's the oily stone calling it that to me, like the color out of space is where he got that idea which strongly suggests that the oily stone has something to do with meteorite. Okay, opalescence. Now, it's not... I guess it is iridescence. <clears throat> you get the idea. You know what I'm talking about. That colorful sheen yeah. that's on top of, that of color oil. Streak. Yeah. yeah. That's what we should think of as the oily stone. It's like something that you can't... A color you can't quite fix or describe. And so... The ghost grass also, like if you remember the, even the plants in the movie, The Color Out of Space, like had that weird glowing color. Like it, it corrupt the meteor in The Color Out of Space, it corrupts the plants and it kills a lot of the natural life. So when you look at this peninsula, like it makes a really good explanation for why it's like this. And it's kind of right in the story. Like you said, there's no emperor after the Bloodstone Emperor. And... He supposedly reigned during the long night. So it's like, well, what destroyed the great empire of the dawn? Well, it was the long night. We know that. It's just a matter of mm -hmm. what caused the long night. And then, oh, by the way, the Bloodstone Emperor <laughs> worshipped a black meteor. So not only yeah. do we have the meteor, we've got the idea that it is magic. He's worshipping it. So it really implies that there's a, an entity attached to the meteor. And that's a straight up Lovecraftian idea, is it not? Yeah. Yeah, because again in in uh Lovecraft, the oily black stone, which is I, I say this, I don't I've said this so many times, but it always bears repeating. It's uh the shining trapezohedron is purposely dropped here. And the shining trapezohedron is a means of summoning Nyarlahotep, a chaos god who just causes death and destruction and he does it for the lulls, basically. That is, that is his character. And that's what the thing does. So it's this is George's adaptation of that of the of this that like chaos summoning stone. Mute. I was just saying thank you, Tim. As far as the notes, I've got the Tim notes and the Dave notes. So the Tim notes are the Lovecraft side, and the Dave notes are the Song of Ice and Fire side. We're starting mostly with the basics of the A Song of Ice and Fire here, but as you can see, we're also going to bounce into the Lovecraft stuff sort of as it comes up. Um, and then eventually we're going to go hardcore with the King in Yellow. So, so yeah, the Oily Black Stone. The thing is, there's too much Oily Black Stone for it all to be Meteorite Stone, Tim. Unless George is just being <laughs> very unrealistic, kind of like when he made the wall too high. 700 feet tall. You know, he said that, oh, I made it too tall. Shouldn't really be that tall. Um, there's too much. Like, the largest meteorite we've ever found here is the size of, like, a small bus or something like that. They're really heavy. They're dense and heavy. They're mostly made of iron. You don't get enough meteorite to build a city out of. Like, that's just not happening. However, hmm. in the color out of space the meteorite transforms the land around it, okay? Yeah. And in real life, what happens is when a meteor or comet impacts, it basically vaporizes most of it. And the ground rock underneath of it also vaporizes because a, me a falling meteor pushes a wave of superheated air, some like 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit, 
like burned air compressed in front of it. So there's a shock wave of just God's oven breath. Okay. So everything is burned. The rock is vaporized. And a lot of times what will happen is uh, new rock um, conglomerates will form, will fuse together. Uh, you'll get the tectites and things like that. So the, the oily black stone, my best guess, Tim, is that it is, you can just quarry it, you know, either in a shy or at Stygi. And essentially, the, the meteorite has transformed the land. And so the, the, the natural rock there is probably all oily stone and you just harvest it, you know. Um, same thing idea, like if the city was built out of regular stone, now it's oily, it tells you like all the stone here was transformed into oily stone by this magical curse. It's like leached into the ground. And so... The question here is like yin. And we're going to bounce around a little bit, sorry. But yin. I didn't I didn't bring the yin art with me, but yin is made entirely of oily stone as well. So the question becomes was yin built out of oily stone that was harvested from the shadowlands, meaning that it would have been built after the long night? And it could still be thought of as a city older than time because, like, if you build a city during the long night, let's let's say Bloodstone Emperor builds it during the long night for some strange reason, um, it's going to be forgotten about. Nobody goes to Sothorios. So whenever Nymeria found it, it's just going to be like, well, I don't know how old it is. You know, it's just weird. <laughs> but the thing is, if Yin really is super-duper-duper duper old older than the long night and built by squishers or something, as I think Mo Kalen might be, then you get to, well, where do they get the oily stone from? If the meteor fell at the long night, was there a meteor that fell before that and made oily stone in the past? Are there multiple cycles of it? Um, this is where I start to wonder if maybe the oily stone is older than the long night and that the deep ones did build a shy or something. Cause like, it really seems like they built Yin. So what's your answer to that? The Yin question. I think it's probably similar to whatever happened to Ashai. Um, because it's it, from what we've seen in the, in this story, it seems like there were multiple meteor impacts. That oh, they didn't just right. hit in one place. I forgot. So that, that probably is the best explanation, yeah. Yeah, so if Yin is another impact zone, just like Ashai, or, or possibly Stagai is like the ground zero spot for the one that hit the Shadowlands, and then the Hammer of the Waters is another meteor hitting and breaking the Arm of Dorn. Thousand Islands is probably another meteor strike, or at least a shockwave from one that floods that city, that floods that kingdom and turns it into uh, the sea girt scatter of windswept rocks, as it's called. So it does seem like there were multiple meteor strikes, maybe at the same time, maybe at different times. But I think the idea is like uh, this, like someone in the chat had, had they called the root, uh, they had said uh, the, the meteor is like a seed that now hit the earth and is now corrupting the stone and the trees. And we've talked about how weirwoods don't really die. They petrify. And we've mentioned that shade trees might do the same thing. So if you have a, a city built of a mix of stone and wood, because, uh, you know, different different materials can go into construction of these things. But if this meteor, this corrupted meteor, this like chaos stone comes and it starts messing with the natural properties of organic things like trees and stone, and then over time corrupts them. And that's how they become oily black stone. And it's like a process from there. It's just leaching the life uh, out of what was, it's leaching the life, not just out of the people that are living there, but also out of the materials that they use. Anything organic is becoming corrupted. Okay, those are good thoughts. Um, I definitely think we should think about multiple meteor impacts, whether it's during the long night or at different times, because that's usually what happens. Comets and meteors 
tend to break up as they're falling through the atmosphere, comets especially, because they're more fragile. And so you get the multiple impacts. That's very likely. I also think that, you know, the first god emperor of the great empire of the dawn, he was said to descend from heaven and then ascend to the stars to rejoin his forebears. So the oldest ideas about the great empire of the dawn are that they are star lords or that they come from the stars. And he's carried around in this pearl palanquin. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know that that was literally a carved out meteorite palanquin. That would be very heavy. But the symbol is interesting. Riding around in a pearl. Like, that's kind of like a moon symbol. So, again, he's, he's a sky character. Um, but it's really... Okay, so Danny's vision of the Great Empire of the Dawn, they're all holding swords of pale fire. Right? And the sword Dawn is this strange white Valerian steel sword, kind of. And it probably comes from the Great Empire of the Dawn. So... The theory here could be that originally there was an older meteorite that the Great Empire of the Dawn learned how to use and that those pale flaming swords are basically either multiple Dawn swords or it represents the idea of Dawn being handed down from emperor to emperor, okay? One or the other. Dawn is a meteor sword and it's white. So maybe the Bloodstone Emperor was like, doing a bad version of what happened before. Meaning, he knows that meteorites are magic, that sometimes stars fall, and they possess magic power that can make you powerful, because my ancestors did that. And so he attempts mm -hmm. to call a comet or, you know, break the moon or whatever in order to gain his own magic weapon. But everything is corrupted when he does it, because, of course, he does it by dark magic. Maybe the first time... It just fell, and they just found it and used it or something, you know. But the possession of meteors, is it's really important. Um, because and I've, got, I've got some Grey King notes down here. But Grey King, he possessed the fire of the sea dragon. And he possessed the fire from the burning tree that comes from the thunderbolt. So it's like he's possessing the fire of the gods in multiple ways. And those myths are multifaceted. But the thunderbolt, part of that is a meteor strike. And the same with the sea dragon that drowns islands. It seems to be a meteor strike that, you know, causes tidal waves. And he's possessing the fire of this thing. And when you put that together with the Danes, it's like the Great Empire of the Dawn and the Bloodstone Emperor, they really seem to like meteorites. So... This could have been the key to their magic power going back a long time. So there could be multiple cycles of comets and meteor impacts as well. And that could be the explanation for Yin. I would guess that Yin was built around the time of the Long Night. And what happened was, or this is one guess. I, have, I really can't decide. But perhaps a meteor fell in Sothorios. And your, your deep ones or your brindled men or whatever humanoid was living there at that time took advantage of it. Pearlescence, I think, is the word I was thinking of, too. Um, no, it's not. There's another one. It doesn't matter. You guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, so basically, a meteor falls there, and maybe the people in the jungle there build, you know find the place where it's turned the stone black and then they build a city out of it. Or maybe Yin, like Shai, was built out of regular stone and then transformed. Um, it's frustrating not to be able to decide. It really is. But that's kind of the thing, is that George wants... There has to be a point at which you can't pry open the seams of the story. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, it has to disappear into antiquity at some point. Um but what he's implying, he's implying specific scenarios, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, iridescent. Yeah, I think that is what I was looking for. Iridescence. Thank you, Harrison Grand Williams. They're all so similar, all these words. The point is, even if we can't decide exactly what happened, we can definitely bark up the right tree, if you will. Okay, so... Well, 
I think if we take the idea of multiple meteor impacts and we take that back to the story of how there used to be two moons, but one flew too close to the sun and cracked and a thousand dragons rained out. Now, if we take that at its most literal idea that this was a planet that had two moons and now only has one because the other moon broke, that's going to be multiple meteors, big, small, all different kinds of sizes. Even a ring of meteors would come from a moon cracking. And if we think too, like there is an example we can look upon in our own solar system where it's going to happen, and that is Mars. Mars is the red wanderer. And both of its moons are wanderers. It has two moons. One is floating away from Mars to the point where eventually it's going to break free from its orbit and become a free floating object. The other is coming closer and closer to Mars to the point where one day it's going to collide with Mars. And Mars is going to have that situation where one of its moon breaks and it's going to suffer the impact that comes from that. So planetos, as we like to call it, is probably may have been in this eventual Mars situation. If you have a planet that has two moons, but one breaks, all those those pieces have to go somewhere. Yeah, and if you get into the realistic, like breaking a moon would be so catastrophic for the Earth. Like, as it would have to be a very mm -hmm. small moon, you know, like a lot further away than the regular moon. Like, if you broke our moon, everyone's dead. Absolutely, um, <laughs> and yeah, the it would it would it would turn into a ring, exactly a rubble field. Um, I think yeah. what we should think of instead is like comets being called from an Oort cloud every once in a while. You know, the red comet comes from somewhere. There's probably more of them out there. Uh, there's all that stuff about the stranger and the wanderer from far places. That to me, I think is is what we're looking at because. The comet's going to come back around. Rhaegar saw a comet. You know, we don't know how many. Like, if this is all part of, like, like people have mentioned the Torrid meteor stream. It could be something like that, which is basically the remains of a comet that sends stuff at us periodically. It's a comet that broke up and, you know, has turned into this weird elliptical orbit of rocks that are mostly very hard to see because they're in the dark um so real quick this super chat from Di Delphi. if a shy stygi and yin are cities where meteors fell how come they did not get destroyed like the arm of dorn did well a couple of factors one how big is the meteor and two what's going on underneath of it like the arm of dorn it was already like a fairly narrow land bridge and there may have been a fault line under there, given how much land subsided. It seems like probably a fault line got triggered there. And usually when you have that narrow strip of land, like like the Isthmus of Panama, like those are created by a fault. When you have two continents that are next to each other, and then there's this little string of land in between them. Uh, like if you look under uh, the tip of South America and Antarctica, you'll see this weird fault, you know, mountain ridge that runs between them. So... There was almost certainly a fault line there under the arm of Dorne that got set off and led to that land collapse. Now, as far as Adishai and Stygi, we're talking mostly magical effects here. So the meteor doesn't necessarily have to be huge to cause this effect. Uh, yeah, so I think mostly it's just where it falls and what's going on there. Yeah. It's a matter of size, scale, and yeah, and exactly, and location. Location, location, location. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, we've talked about the, so the reason, the Great Empire of the Dawn, I do want to point out, is not said to be part of the Great Empire of the Dawn. I'm sorry, Ashai, rather, is not said to be part of the Great Empire of the Dawn. I believe that Martin left that obscure for us to figure out. But if you look at the borders of the Great Empire of the Dawn, it does look like it includes Ashai. Ashai can be reached by land from Yi Ti. Miri Master goes there by caravan. Okay. Um, and uh, the Great Empire of the Dawn was also a maritime power because it included the Isle of Lang. So if they're sailing to Lang and they're occupying Yi Ti, they're basically surrounding Ashai. And being such a large city, it's like, yeah, obviously that's part of the Great Empire of the Dawn. 
probably the, the capital, yeah. you know. But that is a theory. And I the just thing- want to point that out. That is that is my theory. Also, the Azor well, High take- stuff. Oh, go ahead, Tim. If we take what's told to us in the world of ice and fire, the borders of the great empire are everything between the bones and the five fourths. Like th- that is it. Pretty much. Those are its bo- its map borders. But <laughs> borders, let's let's be real. Bo- borders are they're they're just lines drawn on a map. The reality of of nations is that your influence is always going to go well past whatever your territorial borders are. So even though things like in the Far East may have not been part of the Great Empire proper, they're still going to feel the effects of the Great Empire simply by being in such close proximity to them. Same for things west of the Bones, because even the bone, even though the Bones are this huge, treacherous mountain scale, there's roads carved into them. We got the steel, the sand, and the stone roads. Those are trade routes. Those are essentially silk three versions of silk roads for the Great Empire. Something that they probably guard it, something that they probably charge tolls on. So the free flow of trade and ideas and people from the Great Empire to the further east and to the further west is something that would have happened. Just like how people in China knew the, about the existence of Rome. When you have an empire that th- that's this big, this technologically advanced, if we believe the words, this magically advanced, then of course its influence is going to permeate well past its, its borders. So, and even the five forts too, they don't completely close off the entire continent. They, they link up with the Bleeding Sea and the Mountains of the Morn as natural barriers, but eventually, just like with the wall, like with the wall, you go far enough east or far enough west, eventually the wall ends and you can get around it. Same with the five forts. You go far enough north and far enough south, you can get around them. It can continue going. So I think the Great Empire, for whatever its borders were, definitely its influence is, reaches even further than just what we're told. Yeah, and than the, just that that highlighted area. <laughs> yeah, and the the main thing I I sort of said was like, well, if the Great Empire is so big and powerful, and then right mm-hmm. next to it is this biggest city in the world, like, well, who built the biggest city in the world that wasn't the Great Empire of the Dawn? That was their rival, or yeah. like right next to the like, how are you going to build the biggest city in the world right next to the biggest empire in the world? But you're somebody else. It doesn't really yeah. make sense. And Ashai is not, if these are people coming from further east, Ashai is isolated. It's not a defensible mm-hmm. place from further east, like it's on the tip of a peninsula. It's the type of place that would be controlled by a maritime power, which is what the Great Empire of the Dawn was. So it comes yeah. together pretty tightly to understand that Ashai is the capital. I've really never had anyone challenge that. To be honest, yeah. like everyone, once I explain that, everyone's like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Now, <clears throat> the final thing is that um, the Great, em- Great Empire of the Dawn are the proto Valerian dragon lords that, you know, we heard so much about <laughs> at various times, right? So, Septon Barth talks about people from Ashai teaching the Valerians how to tame dragons. Those are these people. The legend of Azor High comes from Ashai. It's all tied up in dragons. Um, Danny dreams of gemstone-eyed kingly ghosts, and they have Valerian hair and uh, flaming swords. So Ashai and dragons are often linked, just in the first book. Like when Illyrio says, oh, these are dragon's eggs from the Shadowlands beyond Ashai. They're not. They're a list of farmen's eggs, but... It's a it's a believable lie is the point. Like uh, the Shadowlands mm-hmm. of Ashai, it's a place where dragon eggs come from. Okay, yeah. and then Danny also they're talking about you know maybe dragons are still there. Bran sees dragons, sort of what is it like sleeping under the dawn or something, and when he's looking in his weird vision. So there's tons of suggestions right in the first book that there are dragons in Ashai, or that they come from Ashai, or that the Valerians came from Ashai. And the answer to all of that 
is the Great Empire of the Dawn, being the builders of Ashai, who were also dragon lords. So then that brings us to Westeros, because in Westeros we have the Fused Stone Fortress mm-hmm. under the High Tower, and Fused Stone is only made by dragon lords. So dragon lords yeah. came to Old Town, and that was before the Long Night, before Valeria existed. So that kind of has to be the Great Empire of the Dawn. And this all makes sense because the whole point of Ashai, I mean, of Azor High, uh, is that he fights the Long Night. He fights the others. Lightbringers for fighting the others. The dragons are for fighting the others. So all of this Azor High Ashai stuff has to have a way to get to Westeros and connect with the last hero and his sort of dragon steel and all that. The Great Empire of the Dawn is that connection. It mm-hmm. and that few stone fortress at Old Town begins to explain, okay, people came to Old Town who weren't first men. They were ancient dragon lords. And this is where that ingredient comes from. Because we we all know like this story parallels the shit out of itself. We've got all these dragon yeah. lords coming to defend the wall and fight the others here in this story, Danny and John and fucking Maester Aemon was up there too, maybe Tyrion, you know, whatever, whatever. So, a Blood Raven, obviously. Um, and it's like, okay, well, where did the Dragon Lords come from the first time around? Because we know Valeria wasn't in Westeros. Well, the Great Empire of the Dawn is the answer. So, yeah. now, and that is the story. Go ahead. Going to what I said about about how your influence never ends with your borders is the fact that there are all these seemingly great empire colonies dotted around Westeros. And that is, and they're always around islands too. Cause we got like old town, the, the high tower is technically on an Island situated on old town. We have Pike, we have uh, Starfall, which is technically an Island in the Torrentine. Uh, then in between, and then on your way to all that, there's those three islands that Alyssa Farman discovers with the pigs and the fruit and the Komodo dragons. Those are like pit stop islands along the way. So, yeah, like you definitely see that before the first men ever arrived, there were already people visiting Western Westeros, visit, visiting the Western coast. And that it, and it seems likely that it was great empire explorers establishing colonies establishing out outposts trading towns just whatever they could and probably forging uh relationships with the children and with the giants that being our f- sort of first contact with the other humanoid races exactly and you can see it here so starfall is not labeled um but it's this other river mouth just south and east of old town so right here where it says the Red Mountains by the H in the go south on that river and that Starfall right there. So Starfall, Old Town. Now Casterly Rock, Land the Clever is said to have come from the east and he has golden hair and he stole the fire of the sun to color his hair. So he's both a Prometheus fire stealer figure, a potential proto valerian and somebody who came from the east. Okay. Um, and then, of course, the Iron Islands, tons of, they all, they think that they are descended from ancient mariners across the Sunset Sea, flat out. Their old songs and myths say that. Uh, Gilbert Farwind gives a very moving speech about that. And, uh, yeah, so it does seem like all along this west coast of Westeros, there is a sphere <laughs> of influence. Now, it does occur to me that Casterly Rock and the Iron Islands there's a big gap between there and Old Town and Starfall. So it's almost like there's two different zones here, potentially. Um, and you think of the colonization of the Americas. England made multiple trips, and then Spain and Portugal got in the mix, right? And they sent colonists, and the Dutch sent colonists. And it's like there probably wasn't one trip. Okay, like they built mm-hmm. a few stone fortress in the style of a Phoenician trading fortress, potentially to trade with Westeros in an ongoing fashion. So the Great Empire of the Dawn is probably coming here over a prolonged period of time, long enough to build a fortress. You don't do that in a day. I mean, actually, you can with dragons and magic. 
But <laughs> setting that aside, it does seem like, yeah. <laughs> you know, a colonization type of thing. So you mentioned those three islands that Alyssa Farman found that had pigs on them. That's a major, pigs aren't native to islands. So obviously somebody stopped there, left the pigs there so that they would propagate and they could stop and get some ham on the way home. This is a great yeah. breakthrough that somebody had when we were talking about this. Now, the lonely light. I'm, I will, look, you guys better watch all my Ironborn videos because I am going to give away some of my secrets today that I am hoarding. I've got all kinds of secrets. One of them is an explanation for the far winds. They are really weird, right? They have color changing eyes. Gilbert Farwind has got a very strong belief in the land across the Sunset Sea. And maybe they skin change walruses or whales or something. Okay. So, thank you. Everyone's promising. You better watch. You better. It's going to be worth <laughs> it. That'll be so good. These videos are awesome. I can't wait to get them out. I just recorded the Ironborn video last night. Part I finished it. Anyway, the first one. So, we've all been thinking about the lonely light backwards, meaning like, uh, who are these ironborn that went out there and lived on these remote rocks? It's like 13 days sail from the iron islands. It's way the F out there. Okay. This is almost like Pacific Islander stuff going out to mm -hmm. live on an island that remote. Okay. Make sure the chat is live. Yes, we're good. Okay. But I think this is backwards. The far winds did not go out there. Um, if, the, if the ancient mariners were sailing east from Ashai, they would have come to the Lonely Light first before they reached the Iron Islands. Because you might think, oh, well, how would they find it? It's a small island. Well, seabirds is the answer. Seabirds and ocean currents. That's how the Pacific Islanders found all those little fly speck islands. They didn't just go back and forth in a grid until they found yeah. an island. Hoping, like the, cur the currents. We got lucky. <laughs> yeah. The currents take you to these places. <laughs> and once you get close, yeah. the birds you can follow as well. Okay. So when they're sailing to Westeros from a shy, they would come to the lonely light first. And what, think about what would happen. There would be some people that would be done sailing. There'd be some injured and sick people. There'd be some people that like, I don't even know if there's anything else past this island. I'm good right here. And then the, everybody else yeah. is going to keep going to the Iron Islands. Now, once they find the Iron Islands and they find Westeros, eventually they're going to come back. They're going to come back through. And so the Lonely Light will end up being knitted together with this colony on the Iron Islands. They're going to have contact and stuff. But those far winds, they are original. They are more like the original ancient mariners, perhaps, who came to the Iron Islands than anybody else on the Iron Islands because they would be descended from people who stopped there before they got to the Iron Islands and potentially haven't bred very much with people from the mainland. So that's why they have weird color-changing eyes. Remember... The Great Empire of the Dawn, they're known for their different colored eyes. Danny sees the gemstone eyed emperors, they all have different color eyes. So the green seers also have different color eyes. So we don't know if that's a green seer thing or not, but whatever's going on with the far wind eyes, definitely a, a magical trait from the Great Empire of the Dawn. And then that leads us to okay, so are they skin changing or are they? breeding with squishers out there, which is it? Um, and, or could skin changing even be part of like breeding with squishers? Tim, I'll give it to you. I mean, that's the thing it could be. If we look at Lovecraft, the thing about squisher human uh, relations is they come from a pact and it's usually some kind of a deal is made usually for some kind of riches uh shadow over and smith is is our best example um obed marsh makes a pact with the deep ones in exchange for fishing rights and gold and the deal is okay then you give us some people some men women and children 
and and the goal is it's for them to breed with. Eventually, after Obed Marsh dies and people find out this pact and they're like, oh, well, we didn't agree to this. They try and break the pact and then the Deep Ones exact revenge. And that is why Innsmouth is now this like uh, run down town. It's only allowed to live. It's no longer getting the riches. It's only getting the fish. And that's simply because the Deep Ones are trying to keep them alive. So here, it's probably we could probably look at the same idea. A pact is made. Squishers are probably... It really is a sex for money exchange that's going on in Shadow over Innsmouth. And I wouldn't be surprised if the same deal is what happens between humans that arrive in Westeros or humans that are still off in Essos uh, making packs with the Deep Ones that are around those areas. Because the thing with Deep Ones is that their cities, they have... Because they build. The Deep Ones have underwater cities. But these cities are never far from human populated <laughs> areas. They're always, they're always near coastal cities or populated <laughs> islands because the entire point is to farm humans. It's to make some kind of deal with them to be able to farm them. Sorry, guys. I thought my mic was on mute. I just coughed right into the mic. Apologies. Apologies. Um, okay, so this is a whole new topic that you're broaching here. Let's just put a pin in this for half a second, and I want to catch up on a couple okay. super chats and PayPal's, and then we'll talk about the watery halls. Okay, where the <laughs> Roinar squisher hybrids is that how they got their water magic? I don't think so, Tim. I'm open to your question here. Um, as far as do the deep ones inhabit freshwater rivers or are they mostly saltwater beings? I don't really see a lot of clues that the Roinar are deep one compromised. I think they are literally just tapping into water magic, but what do you think? Yeah. If, if we're basing ourselves solely off Lovecraft and all of the deep one cities that we are given ideas are, they're always uh, out in the middle of the ocean. They're not just in like inland rivers, like the way the Roinar are. So the Roinar's water magic seems to be more of a river magic. and might be more of a connection to, their worship of the old man of the river, those giant turtles. Yeah, yeah. And basically, and this is a point I wanted to make about the magic in this world, like everything is magical and there's no system. You can build a system around anything, but the magic is never confined to a system. Like I've said, Valerians use fire magic, Reloris use fire magic, and some woods witch out in the woods looking at her campfire might use fire magic too. She doesn't need a pass from Melora or from Benero to be able to do that. Okay? And the same thing is true for the ice magic. Like it's there's evidence that unless the others built the wall, there was a human that used ice magic. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. that that wasn't the others. And we can see cold hands is animated by cold magic, but isn't under the thrall of the others. So yeah. Magic is, is very chaotic in this world. It seems like anybody can grab a hold of it. And like, okay, here's another example. Runes. Rune magic is a principle. The first men use it. The Valerians use it. They use it on their horns. They use it on their armor. Both. The Royces put runes on their armor. And that weird horn, the, the fake horn of Jorman or whatever it was, is clearly has old first man runes on it as well. And then the Valerians are banding their magic horns with metal engraven with runes. So they're completely different magic systems. The first men and the Valerians, like they have different culture. However, they both found their way to this similar kind of rune magic. So that just shows you magic is wild. It can be tapped into all over the world by different people. And it might end up looking somewhat similar. But yeah, so like... We have to stay away from trying to categorize this stuff too much. Like every... Mm -hmm. George loves weird crossbreeding, okay? So every little mm -hmm. place where two cultures or magics intersect could produce a new hybrid that is its own little thing. That's kind of how I feel like he thinks, okay? Yeah. So for example, um, you're talking about the watery halls and the way that the Deep Ones build cities just off the coast... So they can essentially farm people, make these packs with mm -hmm. people, and get the people to give them women and children, 
Uh, and then eventually they create in these hybrids. Like you said, in some stories, the hybrid people, as they get older, they get more fishy until they return to the sea. They return to the watery halls. Okay. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I came to Tim in my ironborn searching is that all of this talk of watery halls is real. That's literally just the cities of the squishers under the water. All this ironborn yeah. <laughs> crap about the watery halls. And here's where I figured it out, yeah. because at the Thousand Islands, it is said that there are, well, we know that there are idols, like big stone, mm -hmm. fishy-faced heads that you can only see when the tide is low. But they say that there are also sunken cities further out. Well, maybe they're not mm -hmm. submerged cities. Maybe they're more watery halls built by the deep ones, because obviously the people on the Thousand <laughs> Islands have been extensively farmed by the deep ones. Yeah. So it's a pattern. Yeah. And I'll it's give this, I know you want to, I'll give this to you in just a second. It's the same thing on the Isle of Toads. They sit around worshiping this oily black stone toad idol, and they are all fishy looking. And they are in a fallen state. They don't sail anywhere. They don't, we don't know if they have language or not, but on the Thousand Islands, they don't have language. And so one of the truths that's hiding in Ironborn history is that there is at least one phase of existence, if not more, where people on the Iron Islands were essentially, I think, farmed by the squishers and left in kind of a fallen state. Like when we hear about the Grey King coming there, Tim, and teaching them everything. How to farm, how to fish, how to, not farm, but how to fish and how to weave nets and how to have culture. It sounds like he's teaching people that are very, they don't know anything. <laughs> and they also have forgotten so many things about their history. So I definitely think that at some point, the people on the Iron Islands might have fallen all the way into a state like the people on the Thousand Islands or on the Isle of Toads. And that's what's going on with these watery halls and the squishers. They're farming people all over the place. Your thoughts, Tim? Yeah. So going back to Shadow over Innsmouth. So the name of the squisher city is called Yanathle. And it's located in a place called Devil's Reef. And that's right off the city, the coast of Innsmouth, Massachusetts. So it's Sitting in the middle of the Atlantic, well, not in the middle, it's sitting in the Atlantic Ocean right by Innsmouth. So when you say, like, when the tide recedes at the Thousand Islands and we see this submerged city, well, when tides recede, what they do is uh, they shelter on the reef. And so, Devil's, so the idea of Devil's Reef, well, if the tides recede onto the reef at the Thousand Islands and what we're glimpsing is actually the Squisher City beneath, that would be like us seeing the tide recedes and now we're seeing the Yana Flay that's out there. And then I'd also want to cover, grab a question someone asked. So Orange Tabby asked, Grey Waste Tim, do you think there was a Squisher City in the waters outside of a shy? And my answer is yes, I do. I do. Because I, I think George is drawing on the idea of Innsmouth here. Well, a shy, despite being blighted, people are still willing to go there because of the gold and rubies and how easily they can get because you can get gold and rubies by trading simple things like food and water you go with a you go with barrels and casks of water and you can make a fortune but the question is then well where's this gold and rubies coming from who's mining that you know if a shy has such a dismal population if people can barely are choking on the air out there it, unable to live there Who's who's mining this now? Granted, slavery is still a thing out in out in Ashai, just like it is all over Essos. But are we to believe that there's supposed to be slaves being worked into mines yet out in Ashai, despite there being such small population? Like who's running that show? No, those gold and those rubies that these people are getting have to be that these traders are getting as payment needs to come from somewhere. And then we're told that the gold and rubies are just as cursed as a shy is. So I would think that uh, just like with Innsmouth, originally getting, originally getting gold trinkets from the deep ones when Obed Marsh made his pact, I think a shy is getting its gold and gemstones and all this rubies, all the things that it's using to pay for food and water is probably being given that, to them 
buy deep ones because they don't have the population to be out there working mines to extract this stuff. That's very interesting, Tim. I had not thought of that. Um, <laughs> they could, of course, be just working slaves into death, and we don't hear about it because, like you said, everything is murky that we yeah. hear about a shy. But um, yeah, exactly. wow. No, they just we just oh, find yeah, it on the coming. shore. You know, I mean, we just every morning we come out and there's a few rubies and gold out here and we leave a few babies out and it just works. I don't know. If it ain't broke, don't fix yeah, it, baby. That's the like they, golden rubies doesn't come out of nowhere. Someone's providing it. If, it, if it's and if it's either it's either slave labor that's mining it or it's being given to them by, you know, some third party that we don't talk about. So on the screen, I've got some artwork from the Neo Namicon comic by Jason Burroughs. And uh, this here, you can see the undersea city. These here's is your watery halls, and there's Cthulhu. And here are the deep ones coming out at Innsmouth or somewhere like that. You see the pier, and there mm -hmm. there they are. They're just coming out to you know fuck shit up. So, oh, oh yeah, actually too. I just I just had another thought because. Um, so in Shadow over Innsmouth, when they are being given this gold by the deep ones. Uh, they have to build a smelt to melt it down because the gold they're given is is carved into these intricate little figurines that look like deep ones. And the people of Innsmouth know, like, oh, well, we can't go selling this on the open market. People, It's too weird looking. So they actually ah, have to a statue. build a smelt. What do you mean it's a statue? What is this thing you're trying to give me? Ah, oh, it's just a trinket. It's a carving. Well, they had to build a smelt to melt it down. So that makes me think more of the gold from a shy is cursed. It's like, why? Well, maybe the gold looks weird. If it's coming from deep ones, it might be like this Innsmouth gold. That's dope. I love it. Um, I love it. So, okay. So here's, so this is as, as I'm trying to unravel the timeline of the Iron Islands. And I'm looking at the Grey King and he's marrying a mermaid and, you know, there's all these legends about the Deep Ones and stuff. The thing that really made it click is realizing that the watery halls refer to cities of the Deep Ones under the water. And that the Deep Ones don't just sort of come and go. Like when they set up shop somewhere, they're going to be working there for a while. Okay, so they, they build a city mm. offshore of Innsmouth. And they have a long relationship with Innsmouth. So, the Ironborn believe in watery halls. Thousand Islands people are pointing to the sea and saying, yeah, there's, there's cities under there. The Tullys. House Tully. A first man house. They, even though they worship the Seven now, when it's time to dispose of their dead, all the old culture comes out. It's basically a Viking mm -hmm. funeral where they put Viking the dead funeral. in a boat, send it out into the river, and then light it on fire with a very well-aimed bow shot at Muir. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> and then they talk about sending him down to the watery halls where the Tullys held eternal court. That's exactly the same as the Ironborn beliefs, that they go down to the watery halls. And that's where their afterlife is. So it just shows you when you go back, and I'm going to put my map up on the screen here. Uh, and in House of the Dragon, we get the Volarions have a similar watery burial. Well, if we're talking uh, the Valyrians learning dragon riding, learning the skills to dragon ride from people even older, or people from the shadow, then that wa that watery burial could be another uh, cultural legacy of that other of that older race that taught them dragon riding that oh, i was thinking more that about that it's like country. that's something they picked up on driftmark because there's that uh, whole thing about the merlin king and the pact remember mm -hmm. they gained the a driftwood throne from the merlin king by making a pact with the merlin king so to your point <laughs> a pact yeah with squid, a pact with squish with the merlings yeah. <laughs> And then that makes him a king. So it gives him power. And he's sitting on and a driftwood throne, which is very <laughs> similar to the driftwood crowns that the Ironborn wear. And then they yeah. switch all their dragon symbolism over to seahorse imagery. So yeah. 
I had always looked at that as them getting corrupted by the Deep Ones when they got there. But uh, yeah, it wasn't your voyages that made you rich, Corliss. We know what you really did. <laughs> <laughs> or it, it would really even be like the people living on Driftmark before the Valerians got there were Deep One farmed. And mm. the, uh, the Valerians, you know, became lords of those oh. people and absorbed yeah. that culture. Yeah, House Valerian shows up and says, I can work with this. <laughs> I can work with this. So, so let's look at this, okay? The Tullys of River Run, they're, you have to think, they're in River Run now, but if you go back centuries and centuries before that castle was built, they're just river lords. They're people who live in that area, and they're right next to Iron Man's Bay. Like, look how close it is. There are some foothills in, in between River Run and the coast, but it's not far. <clears throat> and they dress up also, by the way, like fish, just like the Ironborn. They wear fish armor. They dress up like fish. So if you look at all the fish people influence, Iron Islands, uh, you know, the coast right next to River Run, you've got the Neck, which is just north of that, the Three Sisters, White Harbor, um, even the the tale of Artos Aaron involves being friends with Merlings. Um, then you've got Cracklaw Point. Just south of Cracklaw Point is Driftmark. Um, and then you go down a little south of that. And, oh, it's Dern Godsgrief, who married Elenai, the daughter of the Wind and Sea Gods. And then you Shield Islands. Owen Oakenshield supposedly had to kill all the Selkies and Walrus people that were living on those islands. But guess what? You can't kill all the deep ones because they go... Unless you can swim 40 fathoms down, Tim, how are you going to kill all the <laughs> deep ones? You can't. You can't. Oh, I hear a little nimble dick sneaking in. Um, <laughs> but yeah, supposedly they cleared them off the Shield Islands. So you get this idea that the Squishers are offshore everywhere. And at many different places, they have gotten their suction cups there's squishy suction cups onto <laughs> humans and george is leaving us enough clues about packs and things to tell us like this is along the lines of what the deep ones do in lovecraft where there are packs involved there's watery halls offshore mm -hmm. and then you end up with these hybrid people who sometimes worship the deep ones sometimes they're completely terrified of them like the thousand islands people but yeah, this all is sex for money, essentially. And it really also <laughs> ties into all the fairy folklore and alien folklore. That's always about babies and crossbreeding, too. Um, like, if you look at the alien stuff, a lot of the times, you know, they want to take babies. And the aliens are like, they want to interbreed with us so that they can make hybrids that can manifest in our dimension. That's also some of the idea with, like, angels and astral entities and stuff um and th with the fairy circles they want to abduct children what's the main reason that the fairies want to abduct children i can't recall off the top of my head or put it into words simply but it's definitely to breed with so that's essentially what george is working with when he's talking about others and deep ones needing children to breed with you know nimble dick says oh they eat the males but they breed with the female children whereas the others want male babies it's you know who knows if it matters the gender really oh <laughs> so scottish folklore has a good re so it's scottish folklore uh Fairies take human children in order to pay the tithe to hell itself they do this in order to save their own children and then swap their children to be raised by the humans, by the parents of the babies they abduct. Oh, okay. That's nice. So that's like that's like the cuckoo bird type deal with fairy with, <laughs> with fairies. They will kill your kid, but leave our kids behind, and you can raise them. Yeah, it's kind of like John swapping Monster and Mansa's baby too, a little bit. <laughs> um. Anyway. So Nimble Dick says something very interesting. He says, you know, they say the first men killed them all, but don't you believe it? So it, that sentence is very interesting. It speaks of 
deep folkloric understanding and belief, which is simply that the squishers were here first. And when the deep when when the first men expanded through Westeros, they had to deal with the deep ones in places. And that fits with again Owen Oakenshield, a son of Garth the Green, having to kill the squishers and Merlings and Selkies on the Shield Islands. Um, but we can see that as humans are expanding and running into the squishers, all kinds of different things are happening. Sometimes they're fighting them and sometimes they're breeding with them. Yeah. Um, and there seems to be different cycles of existence, especially on the Iron Islands, where sometimes they're falling into a lowered state of existence and then other times being pulled up out of it. Yeah. So... And that actually goes with that super chat that went by. Someone asked, the super chat was asking, uh, what were the squishers doing for the war for the dawn? Like, yeah, okay, so what did the squishers do for the war for the dawn retreat into the ocean? Well, we don't really know, but the thing is, is that they would have, if I had to guess though, if squishers did partake in the war, they would have been fighting on the side of humanity because they have a vested interest in keeping humans alive as as breeders so they would not want the others to succeed to snuff to snuff out all life they they need people alive and living to facilitate their own needs and yeah and and just like you said like when humans get to westeros they're running into all of these different primordial races squishers humans i mean it's not human squishers children of the forest giants all of these different groups that were already living there that they're now dealing with and at times there's violence but at times there's pact and with all three <laughs> at times there seems to be interbreeding and hybrids because cranog men seem to be human children hybrids and we're constantly being told people like hodor and and dunk about the idea of human giant hybrids. Like there just seems to have been a lot of interspecies sex going on in the Dawn era. Which is another overarching point I wanted to make today in case anyone's not clear on it is that, yeah, humans weren't just breeding with children of the forest. They were breeding with everything that they could. And that's guess what, <laughs> what happened in real life. If you guys are into like any of the Neanderthal research that's been going on, Homo habilis, all the different uh, old, you know, different variations of humanoids, uh, genus Homo, like they, if they could interbreed, they did. Um, Denisovans mm -hmm. and Neanderthals interbred and humans interbred with Neanderthals multiple times. And it wasn't just like these one, like it happened multiple times in multiple areas and the lines between the hybrids aren't nearly as clean as we thought. The whole thing is a tangled web, essentially. So George is mm -hmm. imagining it the same, only with magical humanoids. So green men, yeah. giants, deep ones, children of the forest. Humans are screwing them all or getting screwed <laughs> by them as it happens. Um, and that's... It even opens up the question of where did humans come from? You know, were humans created? from children of the forest and giants and green men. Um, and so let's talk about green men. Okay. Because we're going to come back to Westeros, but one of the questions that I have is about green men coming to Westeros. Okay. Let me try to frame this as quickly as I can. This is part of what I said to you when I asked you to come into the stream. So we're going to talk about, I'm going to review the evidence in a minute why the old ones from Lang are green men. But the question arises once you believe that, did green men come from Lang to Westeros and end up on the Isle of Faces, or are these two separate pockets of a surviving species that once was far more populous? Like, for example, the Ifekevron seem like children of the forest north of the Dothraki Sea. Those seem like two separate pockets, you know, a different surviving pocket of children who survive there. We don't really think of children of the forest migrating from Westeros back to Essos and forming a colony in the woods there. However, the green men are different 
the green men may be more than just bigger children of the forest. They may be very different behaviorally and culturally. And that's one of the things that we want to get into here is, you know, to the extent the green men are being modeled off of things from Lovecraft and not just Sir Nunos, mm -hmm. that it opens up some different possibilities. Okay. And the second part of this, did the green men come to Westeros? Garth the Green is described exactly like a green man. He is said to maybe have been the guy who led the first men across the arm of Dorne. <clears throat> so maybe he's the first, he's the leader of the first men into Westeros across the arm of Dorne, even though they cross the arm of Dorne and then Garth ends up all the way over in the reach on the other side. Interesting. Um, or it's also said that Garth the Green may have just been the first man in Westeros and that he's wandering around talking to the children of the forest. Now, Garth the Green probably represents green men, not just a singular green man, but rather green men in general. So what that means is that either green men led the first men across the Arm of Dorne, which may be, um, or, or green men were in Westeros first before the first men. So when it says Garth was wandering around West, it means that green men were in Westeros with the children and the giants before humans came there. And the last part of this, well, I guess the question is, if people sailed from Lang, but if green men sailed from Lang to Westeros, is that Garth? Is that the green men? Is he an ancient mariner, perhaps, and not somebody who walked over the arm of Dorne. And then the last part is the Grey King, who seems like a green seer as well, and also an ancient mariner. So we start to have this idea, it's like, oh, are green seers and ancient mariners the same thing? And that if green men are ancient mariners, then they are green seers as well. So that is now how we're going to pivot this stream. This will bring us back to the origins of a shy, but sort of from a different angle. So what do you have to say about the framing of this topic? And then we will get into Lang and the old ones. Yeah. Well, when we, with the Langi and the physical description that we're given of them, they seem to have some aspects of children and giants because they have the gold cat's eyes, but they're also some of the tallest people in the world. It's seven or eight feet tall. So everyone in the chat who's wondering about human-giant relations, no, you should really be thinking about the acrobatics involved in a children of the forest giant coupling, okay? That's disenchantment territory. <laughs> you were muted, would you say? You just said acrobatics, I'm dying. That the was acrobatic. the best use of acrobatics I've ever heard. Carry on, Tim. It's, it's all you, baby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So yeah, so so the Lang like I said, the Langi got they have they have aspects of children of the forest and giant, but I, I, I'm I don't know the physics of how that one would happen, but it's fantasy, who knows? But that's why the idea of them being a green men is probably better than that because I mean George can write whatever he wants, but I just don't know how that one would be physically possible. <laughs> Oh, look, real quick, uh, Kelly Johnson sent in to PayPal, and I really appreciate you, Kelly, because I appreciate PayPals. And uh, if anyone would like to support the program, the PayPal link is in the description below. Kelly is asking the, the right question. What type of Great Empire of the Dawn sorcery did Garth Greenhand bring to Westeros, and how long did it extend his life? So you can see that it's almost a theory more than a question here. But a lot of people ever since I came up with the Great Empire of the Dawn Theory, have been wondering if Garth the Green was a gemstone, was he an emerald emperor or something like that? Um, and the bigger question is, does Green Seer magic come from the Great Empire of the Dawn? I had always thought no, because that's the reason why they're coming to Westeros. But that weirwood arc that the Grey King has makes you wonder, because it seems like something he sailed to Westeros. So where did he get those weirwoods, you know? Yeah. My tinfoil has always been Mossavy because of how if you scroll, yeah, if we scroll up on the map um to the north to the northern part 
northern part of the empire. Um, Mossavi is a parallel to the haunted forest, and we know that Green Seer and and Skin Changers are more accepted up. I mean, ma- more acceptable to say among the free folk. And the description we're given of Mossavi is that it's a land of demon hunters and shape changers, which is another way of saying skin changer. It's one of the uh, mm. it's one of the things that old old Nan uses the term when describing them, and Jojen uses it again when describing skin changers is shape changer. And Mossavi is not disconnected from the Great Empire because it's not blocked by the forts. Like you could walk from the Empire to Mossavi. So the idea of green seers coming from there into the empire is definitely possible. Yep. See, like you go over the bleeding sea, you can walk through. You can walk through Nefer to get to Mossavi. They 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 had an op- they had an open road into the great empire. So you make a in your notes you made a great point here that I think really makes this clear. So, um. There's eastern, there's eastern variants of the children of the forest in the Efekevron. Um, eastern variants yep. of the giants in the Jogwin, which are right here at the north of the bones. Um, Deep One activity seems to be everywhere, especially at the Thousand Islands. Um, there are dragons over here. So basically, and then there's shade trees, which are similar to weirwood trees. So basically every magical thing that we find in Westeros, we find a version of out of Westeros. And that strongly implies that in the ancient past, this magic shit was everywhere. So it becomes more likely than not that weirwoods and stuff were other places as well. Um, Mm -hmm. The only thing I wonder about that is like, there's still a lot of weirwoods left in Westeros. Like they're hard to get rid of. So if there were weirwoods elsewhere, how would that have been completely eradicated? They w- they'd have to be somewhere that we just haven't been yet, like in Mossavi or on the Isle of Lang. Like, we don't know yeah. what's on in the woods there. Well, what we get, what we have is with Ashai, Ashai is blighted, but then east in, in the western part, what used to be the patrimony of Harkum has been reduced to three cities, only three cities, and that is because of widespread desertification that is happening. Weirwoods need water. They need water or blood or something. They're not getting that. Like most of the, fo- like, yeah, that's uh, the Great Sand Sea is now, a, is all dried up. Um, out in the Far East, the Graves Waste is a frozen desert. It's referred to as in at the end of World of Ice and Fire, after the Ashai chapter, when we get little tidbits of, of the even further east, they just call them the eastern deserts, like Bow t- Bone Town, the Dry Deep, and all that. It seems like there's widespread desertification happening all over, except for Mossavi and Yi Ti, are no- which are at the north and the southern ends, are our last where our last remaining forests are. So if there's weirwoods out in the far east, then Mossavi, the grim gray forest, seems like the most likely candidate. And I like how you've um, pointed out that there's a lot of parallels between Westeros places and places over here. Like, for example, when Cersei is telling Ned to piss off, she's talking about go back to the gray waste you Mm -hmm. Starks call home. Um, So it's like, oh, that's interesting. Are the Starks from the gray waste? The gray waste is a frozen desert. So it kind of sounds like, you know, and then... um, you're talking oh, about the mountains of the morn and the mountains of the moon in the veil. Yep. And how they're the both veil. inspired by the same things from Lovecraft. Some of those parallels, what's the point of them? Prob- I mean, the only thing I could think of would be just what you're saying, to just imply that like there are similar things over here. Weirwoods, the demons of the Lion of Night were those others. Well, they either were others or they were something similar. Right. Mm-hmm. So what I think, what I think is, there's that line. Good, good Queen Alley drops the line of, "You can marry me off to the King of Mossavi or the Lord of Grey Waste. I will always find my way back to Jaharis. And she's saying it like, "You can send me to the ends of the earth, as far away as imaginable." But 
if we cro- if what is across the Sunset Sea, if sailing west from west, if sailing west of Westeros lands you in a shy, then it actually means no. Those things are actually closer than you think. That's what I think the big idea is. A shy is closer than it's made. We think of a shy as being as far away from Westeros as possible. When the reality is, if the world is round, and if there's no North South America continent blocking the way, if Sunset Sea leads to the east to the eastern coast of Essos, then it means a shy is actually a lot closer. Interesting. Um, yeah, that's an interesting metatextual clue. Um, and then we've got here. Let's see, Kelly also asking. How you have a city full of powerful magic users and you still can't drink the water? Well, I mean, maybe they <laughs> boil the water. It says the shadow binders will eat the fish from the river ash. You know, maybe you can drink mm-hmm. it. It probably just tastes like, has like a metallic taste. Uh, but that could be why animals and children don't live long is because the water is not very clean. So it's hard to say. Kelly, that falls into the ta- territory of George's fog of mystery around a shy. We just don't know. Mm -hmm. What's my favorite song from a song of ice and fire. Mine is the last of the giants. Such a sad song. Oh, that's a great call. Rafael Cordova. Um, The bear and the maiden fair is always my go-to because it's so absolutely perverted. When you actually unpack the lyrics, it's kind of delightful. The bears giving the, the lady kind of lingus in in the song. Um, (laughs) uh, But (laughs) But yeah, The Last of the Giants is awesome. That's a good call. I like yeah. that. Uh, yeah, Melisandre so straight up drank poison. So obviously there's magical ways to uh, transmute toxicity. Okay, so let's get into this Lang stuff real quick. Um, some of this will just be review. But we'll go through it real quick. <clears throat> So they're very tall, about eight feet tall, suspiciously tall, too tall for regular humans. Um, They have black hair. They have medium brown to golden skin tone, oiled teak. That's what it's described as. Uh, And then large golden eyes that see well in the dark. It reminds us of the children of the forest, obviously, except for the very tall. So are there tall children of the forest out there? Yes, those are the green men. Um, But the thing is that they supposedly have bred with the old ones. And the old ones live in vast underground ruins beneath the jungle. And boy, do I have some great artwork of underground ruins to show you. Yeah. By the way, Rhaenyra... Sorry, real quick. Rhaenyra was given the Jade Tiara of the Empress of Ling by Daemon. Uh, which is interesting parallel, but uh, yeah, that's that's a Lang mentioned that was in House of the Dragon. Here is a picture of Lang by Draft Urgy, but let's get to the ruins in the jungle, folks. There are ruins, and they go down and down and down, hundreds of feet. And Jarhar sent so many into the ruins that didn't come back. Jarhar being a Yitish emperor when the Yitish conquered Lang, that he had to seal them up. So they're cursed and there are cities in the jungle and that's where the old ones live. So when you first read it, it's presented as totally incomprehensible. Like, oh, just creep show, old ones, ruins in the jungle. But this again shows you the economy of using references to other works because we can figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Who cares about the Lang politics? I don't even know why I put that on here. Um, Me, I care about Lang's politics. (laughs) Well, they're part of the great empire of the Dawn. And then later they're part of the Yitish empire. And so they're ruled by their god empress. But she takes two husbands, one Yitish husband and one native Langi husband. So there's this, it just tells you like the, the Langi... It's weird because, okay, the Langi kind of sound Asian and the Yitish are obviously like Chinese. So you'd think maybe they're distantly related, except for the Yitish are specifically very short and the Langi are so tall. And now in China, there is 
different. Obviously, China is a very diverse and huge populous place. There are very tall Chinese people. Um, they are, that would be, I don't know the names of my different ethnic groups, but the taller folks are from the South, I believe, going back like centuries and centuries. However, the point for our story is that eight feet tall, we're supposed to understand. The Lengi are tall because they have interbred with these old ones, whoever they are. But we can extrapolate that the old ones must be tall and they must have large golden eyes that are good for seeing in the dark, which makes sense because they live in the jungle and in underground cities. So that's about all we can extrapolate from the old ones at first. Also, uh, they're bloodthirsty because four times in Lang's history, Tim, mm -hmm. the god empress who has commerce with the old ones was told to kill all the foreigners. And that is what they did. Mass yeah. executions. So. Yeah. And all I was going to say was like, yeah, because the language that George uses is that they make Congress with the old ones. But again, that's Congress has so many different words. It could just mean that they're having talks with them, but it could mean they're having sex with them. They're and voting. more than likely, they're taking votes. It's both. <laughs> they're voting, Tim. <laughs> no, more than likely, they're both. It's both. And this is probably all. Hey, that, how's that for some pillow talk? <laughs> Kill all the foreigners. <laughs> Hey, baby, you know what would be really sexy is if you uh, executed all the foreigners. Oh, yeah. No, you're right. You're right. Let's do that. So let me give you some artist uh, credit real quick here. This on the left is Sven Bybee, and on the right is Fanquin Zoo. So you got two different kinds of elf cities here. Um, probably we're looking at something more like what's on the right than on the left. <laughs> okay. These aren't your Rivendell elves but I just thought I'd put that up there for kicks. Uh, this one is by Burning Sky Online. That's a video game, so I don't know what the artist is, but this is probably more what it looks like. Good atmosphere there. This one is by Salvo Lo Iacono, and I use this one. I've used all of these in my laying videos, but this, this to me really gets it uh, with the monkey there, the vines and stuff. This is what Lang would look like deep in the jungle. This one is by an artist named Carbo. And this, this has a little bit of a Mayan look to it. And this is by Sam 1551995. Okay, whatever. Um, Sam. So this is very cool. So here you can see the entrance that had to be sealed up, if you will. And then this one is by Jordan Grimmer. So... This is this was just a weird mystery until Dave Lightbringer and his metatextual double symbolic readings got to work here. <laughs> and forgive me for having fun with this, but when I first did this, I thought it was the craziest theory and I didn't even know what to make of it. And to have it turn into something real is just, it tickles me endlessly. What's a better place to live, Westeros or Essos? Uh, mostly Essos. Mostly Essos. Just don't be a slave. Essos has free cities. Seems like a... But the free city... Okay. Look, the free cities and the freehold of Valyria, that's a... Those are not good names because they're all slavers. There's more slaves. Hell, Volantis, the, the slaves outnumbered the free people three to one, so... No, no, I would not... Essos has slavery. You can be captured and enslaved at any time in Essos. No matter where you are. No, that's all. That's fair. <laughs> um, and obviously the name Free Cities is a little ironic. Yes. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah, just like the Freehold. It's irony. Okay, so. Okay, that's the old ones. Where did I put? Okay, let's go over to your notes here. Uh, I think you're looking, yeah, Elder, th so the old ones in Lovecraft is, yep. it refers to one of two things. So that's Elder Things and Great Old Ones. So real, real quick, so, before you dive into this, Tim, hang on. Um, mm -hmm. I am going to go get Cleo and use the restroom. So I want to put you in control here and I'm going to put up some artwork. Do you want the plateau of Lang or do you want 
some horny goat men? Or do you want the well, map? Let's do the plateau of Lang. Okay. I've also got the map. So here's the map of Dream World, just to familiarize you with what we're talking about. Um, now, there are a couple of different versions of Lang, as Tim will explain. But this is from mm -hmm. Dream Quest, I believe, this map. And here's the yes. zoomed in part. So look in the middle, just to the right, and you can see Lang. And here's the close up of it. Okay. And here is another map that someone made. It's the same spot in the north on the right. So as you zoom in, you can see it. Uh, that's, it's that plateau right here. And I'll zoom in one more level. That is the plateau of Lang. So take it away, Tim. I'll be back in like two minutes. Sure. Okay. Hello, Chad. I'm in charge. So we're talking Lovecraft's Lang. And the thing with Lovecraft is Lovecraft was never very consistent, especially with Lang. Lang varies from story to story. The one thing that it always has going for it is that it's always gray and arid. So really, Lovecraft's Lang sounds more like the gray is describable more like the gray waste in George's story than George's version of Lang, which is lush and jungle. But going from story to story, Lang serves numerous purposes. Um, in At the Mountains of Madness, the plateau of Lang is in present day Antarctica. Uh, and what happens is there is a group called the Elder Things, who are also sometimes known as the Old Ones. And they come to Earth millions of years ago. And they land in Antarctica when it was still green. And they build this great city with their giant amorphous blob beast called the Shagath. And they start experimenting. And the idea is that the elder things are the ones who created all organic life on Earth. And it's mainly, including humanity, but it's actually th by accident. They, they, that isn't what they set out to do. They were just doing experiments and we are, and humanity and all animals and all life in general is just to create it by accident. So that's at the Mounds of Madness. But then in other stories of like Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, uh, Lang exists still as a gray, arid, frozen plateau, but it's in the dreamlands. And then there are other stories like The Hound, where Lang still frozen wasteland, but it's out in Central Asia. And that it becomes more taken up with um, with with Lynn Carter in the that's the Zothic legend cycle I'm doing. He goes with the Central Asian version of Lang. And that becomes a backdrop for a lot of the explorers that are finding this uh, love, this the, these uh, star spawn things that are going on in those stories. But the thing with the elder things is that so they accidentally create humanity. They're also the ones who drop the oily black stone on Earth. They do this on purpose. Uh, that is the shining trapezohedron, which can summon the chaos god Nyarlathotep, who is an outer god and. Nyarlathotep could erase all of existence in the blink of an eye if he wanted to, and he would, but humans are too fun for him. He's just a gigantic troll. Uh, but the Elder Things also war against another group called the Great Old Ones, and that is our group that includes things like Cthulhu and Hastur and all the other famous uh, Lovecraft creations, Shubnigaroth, uh, Yig, all, all those big guys. So it's a little uh, bit they like the Titans versus the gods in Greek mythology, kind of. Yeah, yeah. So what it is, is so the, the great old ones lose the war. Um, yeah, what happens, so the other things get here first, the great old ones come later. So it's almost, it's, we can look at it like the, like the first men and the Andals and, and a war ensues, like the elder things get here first, but now other groups are coming from other parts of space, trying to make their own territorial games, gains. A war ensues, the great old ones lose, and a lot of them are sealed away. Uh, Cthulhu is sealed under the sea, Hastur is slung out into space, and he lands on Aldeb the star of Aldebaran. 
Uh, Cthulhu's children are all locked away. But over time, you get humans who become aware of this stuff and they start forming these cults around them. And usually these cults' main purpose, their main goal is to now try and unseal the old ones and let them take dominion over the earth. Okay, so but pause then right here, here. Because this is mm -hmm. this is where we can see at the very least the concept being used by Martin. All of our gods are like this, okay? Does R'hllor exist? Mm -hmm. Maybe. But if he does, he's like a demon fire spirit, okay? More tangible is the great yeah. other. The great other seems to be like maybe the spirit of Night King or something like that in the Weirwood Net, potentially. Um, the three-eyed crow seems to be Blood Raven, but he's joined with the Weirwood Net hive mind. So there's some sort of the old gods is some sort of collective intelligence of very old dead people that are inside the Weirwoods that might be trying to come out or at least shape the world still. The others are mm -hmm. potentially an exiled hive mind of the Weirwoods. Um, so a lot of this feels very similar, especially with the Great Other uh, and the idea that Oh, the other one is right. The Bloodstone Emperor worshiping his meteor. So when you're saying the Shining Trap is a hedron, which is oily black stone-like, is mm -hmm. literally a conduit to some spirit entity. Um, like, this is yeah. all the stuff we've been talking about Euron with for years. Like, oh, maybe he's going to get body snatched by the Great Other. Well, it's like, why was Bloodstone mm -hmm. Emperor worshiping the meteor? George is implying that it's a god. That's what you worship. You yeah. cast down the true gods and worshiped a meteor instead. So it's like, oh, the meteor was his god. It literally had a, an, an intelligence on it. And this is mm -hmm. also perfectly parallel to the main story. Azor High is the meteor. He invades the Weirwood Net and corrupts it and poisons it. That's literally, that's the magical par parallel to the space rock that landed on the earth and poisoned the earth. Like it's the exact same concept, but they might be linked mm -hmm. because Azor High and the Bloodstone Emperor seem to be the same person. So he's literally having meteor magic and invading the Weirwood Net, the same guy or the same group of people. One may have facilitated the other. Um, and so <laughs> the thing about all this, Tim, is that George is probably not going to spell out that the meteors have an entity. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. this is stuff that he's implying. Um, yeah. But the thing that could, that we could literally see is somebody like Euron um, or John when his body is stolen is that his body won't just be stolen, but will be filled with an, a weird alien intelligence. Mm hmm. Yeah. And that's why I've said, like, George's gardener writing style, his throwing of seeds, I've said the seeds double as breadcrumbs because they lead back to his influences, like Lovecraft, like Duralith, like Chambers. And then if you go and you study them and you study, well, where were their influences coming from? It goes back even further. And a lot of them are all tracing their way back to... Uh, pagan gods greek gods egyptian gods norse gods like you said it sounds like the gods versus the titans and it very much is like the war of the elder things and the great old ones it it, it is like if zeus banged an octopus which something something that zeus is want to do and this is the story you get and lovecraft for himself he even tossed in he took uh nodens which is a norse god and placed him directly into the story or not, not Norse, I'm sorry, he's Kel Celtic God, Celtic God. He takes the Celtic God, Nodens, and Nodens becomes another one of these outer gods. Like, he's part of this Lovecraftian pantheon, and he's near the very, very top. Um, but yeah, Nodens is there. And Niarlahotep, the Chaos God, well, that name is taken from Amenhotep, better known as Akhenaten, who was an Egyptian pharaoh who tried to cast down the gods of Egypt and create more of a... Uh, monolithic society based around the sun based around the sun disk and then we take that you juxtapose that with lovecraft's nephrin Ka, the black pharaoh who worships the trazahedron 
And that's how then that leads to Bloodstone Emperor, who worships the Oli Black Stone. Like, again, you take one, you trace back, well, where'd this idea come from? Okay, Nefren Ka. But then Nefren Ka, where'd this idea come from? Oh, Akhenaten, a real Egyptian pharaoh who really tried to establish a new religion. Yeah, he did cast down the old gods in favor of a new one. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I was just thinking when you come bringing up Zeus, like... Every time he has sex with a different person or animal or poses as an animal to sleep with, like new peoples are created from that. And that's kind of what I was mm -hmm. saying about humans interbreeding with all these different elder races is like the new hybrids are each unique and, and independent and interesting. So, um, okay. <laughs> so bringing this back to Lang, first of all, this is Antarctic Lang, clearly by Francois Berenger. And here, this one is by Armand Cabrera. Same idea. Okay. This is cold, frozen Lang, but you can see the cool pyramids and stuff. So this, you know, reminds you of that Ashai artwork by Jovan Delic that we were looking at. Uh, this is a more yeah. stylized one here. This is like the monastery that we're getting into. This is another stylized one by Ruben Megiddo. The last one was Artist Unknown. Um, but okay, so that's all great. Lang is this creepy, weird place in Lovecraft. Okay, awesome. So Lang is also a creepy, weird place in Ice and Fire. It's just a jungle instead of a frozen plateau. What does this all mean? Well, it'll come, it's the men of Lang that are key here. Mm -hmm. These are them, the men of Lang. So the old ones, like Tim said, the old ones lost to the elder, be, elder things. And so the old ones are all locked up. They are sleeping in relay or whatever. They're dreaming and stuff. They they can't. They're not here. That's that. What what is dead can never die. That's what that means. Um, that which is not. Yeah, that is not dead. Which can eternal can it, live and right. with strange eons even death may die. And yeah, what George that means is that, that into, those beings yeah. are beyond death because they're like they're hibernating. So it's like you can't mm -hmm. kill them. They like they just go to sleep. So it's like that is not dead, which can eternal lie. Like if you can hibernate forever, you're kind of unkillable and they can even outlive mm -hmm. death. So that's the idea. So yeah, the people that worship the old ones on Lang are these goat people. They're called the men of Lang. They are satyr like they have goat legs, they have horns and they are observed doing occult practices around fires at night in the forest. Those are the men of Lang. So that's the first thing here is like, okay, in A Song of Ice and Fire, the old ones are these subterranean beings, which are probably tall and probably have golden eyes. Now, I immediately wondered if they were not, you know, some children of the forest like being but a tall child of the forest which would be green men then turns out in lovecraft's lang there are something mm -hmm. similar to green men in that we have you know pan satyrs pan like creatures because that can either be sometimes you see the the horny humanoids in folklore they're more stag like sometimes they're more goat like but that's all the same tradition like dionysus is more pan, you know, he's pan like, he's goat like, but he's related to Kernunos and uh, all that, the green man folklore as well. So yeah. I know you want to talk about Dionysus, um, but let's stick with yeah. Lang real quick. Um, oh, no, all I was going to say was uh, when it comes to the horn man, it's the idea of the horns, whether it's bull, ram, or stag, like those, because they're they kind of become interchangeable at points the point is is because they're all sacrificial creatures bulls ram stags and so the point is though the horns the horn of plenty that whole the the horn of bounty that idea so the horn man whether it be a goat man a deer man or a bull man uh the idea the idea still runs along the same lines and all the all the horned animals have something in common which is that male animals with horns, they use them for competition. Um, they, you mm -hmm. know, the size of them, they literally fight with them. And that's the same for stags, goats, elk, reindeer, rams. Uh, there might be an exception in there somewhere, but for the most part, 
that seems to be a common thing. So the whole idea of Kernunos is that it symbolizes not just nature, but like specifically male, like wild virility and strength. And the idea is like, oh, well, it, you know, it can be focused and it could be good or it can be wild and unchecked and lead to debauchery and chaos. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe debauchery and chaos is That's good. That's all I was for. What's that? That's what I was aiming for. I was aiming for that because you know that I got the Dionysus thing. I wanted, I, was, I wanted you to bring up the Carnuno stuff. Yes. So there's just layers of it here. So the first thing is I want to just finish up with this idea that green men are on Lang because we're only halfway there. Okay. These, we've got <laughs> horny goat men on Lang in Lovecraft land. Uh, but why do I think the old ones are green men? Well, it's because of these quotes. And I'm not going to read them all yet. I'm, I do want to read all these to you, Tim, and see what you can make of them. But okay. I, found, I found this. The first one I found is in this first chapter in The God's Wood, when Cat and Ned are there. And Cat is his cat's inner monologue. And she says, I keep referring to Sir Nunos. Did George say what happened to his old one? It's Ker Nunos, not Sir Nunos. <laughs> I was saying it wrong for a long time, and I still sometimes say Sir Nunos. It, Ker Nunos is a more accurate pronunciation, but yeah. I have wondered if um, George is making a joke with Tyrion's no-nos thing, but uh, anyways. Okay, so look. This is a quote from Cat's chapter in The Godswood. The blood of the Starks still flowed in the veins of the Starks. The blood of the first men, sorry, still flowed in the veins of the Starks, and his own gods were the old ones, meaning Ned's gods. The nameless, faceless gods of the Greenwood they shared with the vanished, vanished children of the forest. So that's interesting. Ned's gods were the old ones, the faceless gods of the Greenwood. It's like, oh, well, are the old ones from Lang, do they have something to do with the Green Seers? You know? And it turns out that there are so many quotes like this. They're endless. So, for example, John at the Battle of Castle Black, he's talking to Satin. And he's like, pray then, John told him. Pray to your new gods, and I'll pray to my old ones. And it's like, oh, that's interesting. George keeps using that phrase. Then there's that great chapter, uh, my favorite chapter, one of my favorites, is the one at White Harbor, where Davos is in jail, and he meets Bartimus and Garth, the two jailers. And it says, you know, the old ones. When Sir Bartimus grinned, he looked just like a skull. Me and mine were here before the Manderleys. Like as not, my own forebears strung those entrails through the tree. So he's talking about which gods he worships, and he's saying the old ones. So again, the old ones are the gods of the Weirwoods, and... Specifically, we're talking about skulls and human sacrifice to these weirwoods. Now, it goes on and on and on, and we'll read some of the other quotes. But once I started picking up on this, I was like, wait a minute. I think George is doing more than just using a creepy turn of phrase. I think he's actually telling us that the old ones from Lang are the same as the, the green seers of the weirwoods. And then, again, we go to Lovecraft's Lang and we find horny goat people. So now I'm really picturing the old ones as green men living underground. Okay, so mm -hmm. would green men live underground? One of the clues is in the Rainwood, Tim. In the Winds of Winter chapter, Aria, uh, Arianne, they're hundreds and hundreds of feet below the ground. And they find on the stalagmites of the cave and the walls of the cave carved faces in stone and they think children of the forest but we've never heard of children of the forest carving stone faces have we no nah. so not stone faces we're not even sure if they carved the tree faces <laughs> and that's exactly and that's in the rainwood which is a basically the closest thing to a jungle that the west westeros has so underground caves with stone faces in the rainwood reminds me a lot of lang and the underground caverns of the old ones. So let's flip back to the Lovecraft Lang stuff. And I'm going to let you build out the rest of the yeah, men of I Lang. Do want, 
the traitor stuff and the Dionysus stuff, and then we'll bring that back to um, Dern God's Grief and the Baratheons. Sure. All right, because I do want to meet your quote with a quote of my own, and this is taken from The Call of Cthulhu. They worshipped, so they said, the great old ones who lived ages before there were any men who came to the young world out of the sky. Those old ones were gone now, inside the earth and under the sea, but their dead bodies had told their secrets and dreams to the first men who formed a cult which had never died. Yeah. You can see where George is... <laughs> Again, like you see, like where is George drawing these ideas from it's all right there in that co this is all this is, this is straight from call of cthulhu what's all this about as the, the cult of the first men worshiping dead gods like oh that go inside the earth and under the sea <laughs> oh they did that they did worship gods inside the earth and from under the sea both ah and the first men phrase is even there too Yep. Like, wow. And the thing, the thing with Call of Cthulhu is, and and in the current story that I'm reading, which someone did ask when the next one I'm working on, Out of the Ages, um, they are what causes the influence of Cthulhu in Call of Cthulhu, and what causes the influence of Zoth Amog in Out of the Ages. It comes from a stone carving, a stone idol of Cthulhu in Call of Cthulhu, and a idol carved out of jade of Zoth Amog in Out of the Ages. I really wish I had it finished before we did this stream because they're, Out of the Ages it is a it, it's a gold mine. I'm so excited. I'm going to be so happy when I get it up because so many of these ideas we talk about actually pop up in Out of the Ages where they talk about how can there be um, all of these similar god names in all these places that are separated by miles and miles of ocean. And it's because Out of the Ages follows Thing in the Pit when an entire continent was destroyed and submerged. And all that's left of it are remnants, are different islands that are now separated by thousands of miles of ocean. Out of the Ages brings up the question of how do these things, how do these, how do these places, like there's 8,000, like the, the Dr. Copeland in Out of the Ages even brings up, he, he straight up asks the question, how can there be two, how can there be a God with such similar names in these two places when there's 8,000 miles of open ocean between them? And the idea is, is because they were all once a part of a giant continent that's now sunk. George is drawing on these ideas. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's, it's, it's a fun thing to do with the fragmented legends and stuff and even like the confusion about where the azor high events took place it's like oh well, he's from a shy but maybe he killed nissa nissa a child of the forest in westeros how's the myth from a shy well if if we have an empire from a shy that colonizes westeros and there's a mm -hmm. villainous or heroic figure that shapes the world their story will be present in both places and 8,000 years later, they will have evolved separately. And so you have the last hero with a sort of dragon steel in Westeros and Azor High with Lightbringer in a shy, but it's we figured out it's the same story. So oh, and if you want another mind fuck, so out again, another reason why I want it out of the ages out, the jade figurine that Zotha Mog is carved out of, it's not described, it's it's made of jade. It's not described as oily black, but it is described as greasy and gray. So it's the same idea. Like these idols, yeah. they look unnatural because they're from space. They're not of the earth. And everything about them says that. And that's the same way that our oily black stone is. Like it is alien in some sense. We know that. So, okay, so Lang, Lang, <laughs> Tim, um, <laughs> these, so these, these, the earliest people, humans are worshiping these old ones. Now the men of Lang, I'm not sure where they fall on the human evolutionary chart, but you can see them here. They are goat humans. And they do worship the old ones, okay? But that's not all they do, right? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the the Langi, the men of Lang and Lovecraft, so they uh, they don turbans to cover their horns, and they actually willingly interact with humans, and they do trade in commerce, and they trade these rubies that they mine in exchange for slaves, um, which then they then take back to their home, but their home is on the moon. So they wait till after dark, after all the people have have. Re- after like the uh, bazaars and the shops have closed and everyone's gone away for the night, that's when they get on their black ships and they start rowing out. But then those ships take to the sky and they fly back to the moon. Mute. And that's just kind that's- of a thing. In Lovecraft, you can do that. You can sail to the moon and back. The cats of Ulthar can leap to the moon. It's just yeah, a thing. <laughs> Don't think about it too hard. But the point is that these horny goat humans, they're not just like forest creatures. They're mm. traders. They yeah. cover up their horns and they go out and trade. And they also are slavers, are they not? Yeah, and they Yeah, because they they uh they you trade the rubies for slaves from the men of Nar. Uh, that's just Lovecraft being racist because the slaves are black. But anyway, but yeah, they do trade rubies for slaves at the at the town of Dilothleen, which sounds a lot like Vase Dothrock, which is also a tra- yeah a, a big trading town where you can deal in rubies and slaves. And and specifically, they have these ships that, like you said, they can sail to the moon. But forget about the moon part <laughs> of it. Just think yeah. about as. The men from Lang as horny humanoids that sail ships and trade with humans. So this is where we get back to what I was saying about did Garth the Green come from the Great Empire of the Dawn? Are the Green Men more than just forest creatures? Were they the ancient mariners? Is Grey King, with his weirwood magic, is he a, 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 an old one? Is he a green man? You know, like, I had never thought about the green men sailing to Westeros or challenging the idea that they walk, you know, that Garth walked across the land bridge. But here's the thing. There's no green men in Essos on the other side of the land bridge. There's nothing. There's no hints of anything that sound like green men anywhere. In Andalos, in Valyria... Nowhere over there. Nothing. Silver Sea, Fisher Queens, Karth, Ifakevron. There's nothing that sound like horny green men at all. Anywhere. But over on Lang, it's pretty clear that the old ones are tall, golden-eyed, and probably horny humanoids of some kind who are a cousin species to the green men of the Isle of Faces or the exact same thing. <clears throat> so it just opens up a lot of possibilities for who these people were. Because remember, I've said that um, during God's Grief and Grey King have a lot of parallels. They both marry mermaids. Durin marries Elenai. Grey King marries a mermaid. Both of them challenge the storm god and then provoke this titanic storm. Durin God's Grief provokes a storm, which is actually the hammer of the waters. It destroys his castle and kills everyone there. All right. Grey King taunts the storm god, lashes out with a mighty thunderbolt. And Durin God's grief implied as a green seer because he dresses up like a green man. And then the Grey King turns out to be a green seer, sitting in a weirwood throne with a weirwood crown. And that weirwood crown seems to be the inspiration for the driftwood crown tradition. Okay, so the whole thing about the stag man is that the antlers look like tree branches. And usually your Stagman Mm. artwork, they will look tree-like. And here, let me flip to my Stagman artwork because I brought it with me. Sorry, hang on. Let's go. Which one do I want to go to first? Um, Here's some Green Man ruins. Uh, But no, let's go to our classic. This is Peter Williams on the left and Autumn Sky Art on the right. So yeah, one guy's got, one green man has ram's horns, one has antlers. 
whatever, whatever, same difference. Okay, so uh, where was I? Where was I? What was I saying? Um, so it kind of fits the idea of like tall humanoids that have golden eyes. Oh, a tree. I was talking about trees. That's what it was. Okay, sorry guys. Sorry, ADHD. I've got some very tree-like ones. Okay, so on the left, this is The Keeper by Ha Ma Din. This is probably my favorite sort of horny tree man artwork. It's, it's a nice splitting the difference. You can see he looks bark-like, uh, but he's also got the horns. He's got the small inner horns and the big outer horns. And then there's also... This one... Yeah, so here you can see some more druids or green men. And I think I... Th this is some actual green man art from medieval places. So the whole idea is that he represents the forest, not just, so he's kind of like, um, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that the wooden crown of the Grey King mm -hmm. and the subsequent Ironborn Kings is the same symbol as antlers on somebody's head. Mm -hmm. That is what I'm saying. And the whole point of the green men being Cernunos people, Cernunos people with antlers, is that they are also tree people, right? They go into the trees. So really, any green seer that goes into the weirwoods, they get antlers because they're wearing the tree branch as a headdress. Okay, and I've got a piece of brand artwork that illustrates this exactly. Let me see if I can find it very quickly. I bet I can. Uh, not so much quickly, but I will find it. Tim, cut in here for me here. Sure. Um, so for all the screaming stuff, this is also my notes. It's all at the very last section, which I called Green Men Among Us, because uh, they are sus. There you get your meme. Um, but I do bring up, I did talk to th this idea of you of green men interacting with humans and being more jovial and just persistent about it rather than the children. And I broke down, well, when you have uh, invade an invasion like like how humans coming to Westeros may have been seen, the different responses from the different races that were already in Westeros, they can be a, they can be one of many things. Like some can try and remain reclusive, and that's what the children of the forest did. They recede back into the forests and the hills, and they try to stay separated from the world of man. The giants, for the most part, they tried that, but out of necessity, they've made common cause with Mance Raider. But there are other forms of life that George has given us that do interact willingly with humans. He gives us the men of Ib and the brindled men. They, now we're told like humans cannot breed with the, with the Ibanese or the brindled men. You, you don't get, uh, or you can't, you don't, you don't get virile offspring. They're either sterile like mules or they're born deformities. But the whole point of this is, is that, but the Ibanese and the Brindle men do engage in trade and commerce. Ibanese are everywhere. The, any port city, any big, any big bazaar city, you'll find Ibanese selling their wares or selling their labor. And the Brindle men of Sothorios, the ones who live on the coast, they have learned the trader talk to interact with other people. So even though they are this differing form of life, I've often, I always compare the men of Ib are like George's version of Tolkien's dwarves and the brindled men are like his version of orcs, but they are still willingly engaging in trade and commerce. So the idea behind that is who's to say that the green men were not the same way. Well, we see this with Lovecraft's men of Lang. They put on a disguise, they cover up their horns and they willingly go out into the world and interact with humans for means of trade and commerce. So I've, 
brought up the idea what if the green men are doing the same like there's nothing to say that the green men need to hide themselves away and be as reclusive as the children they could very well be more prominent than they're given credit for and interacting with people they're just in disguise and we're not seeing it mute mute sorry what i was saying thank you tim is that I'm trying to pull off that disguise. And I'm always talking mm -hmm. about this, but like the green men are actually everywhere. You know, Garth mm -hmm. the Green is a green man, and then he's the father of all the great houses in the Reach. So that implies that the first men are descended from green men, period. Then you have, again, Dern God's Grief dressing up like a green man, or he is a green man. And it's the subsequent Durandans who eventually, you know, it turns into cosplay. Uh, but the original guy was a green man. So that's why I say with Grey King, since he has all these parallels to Durin God's Grief, it raises a couple questions. Was Grey King a green man, like Durin God's Grief might have been? And was Durin God's Grief actually one of these ancient mariners who came to Westeros? You know, a foreigner, just like Grey King is. Because it really does seem like the same story here. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got, you've got these, these green men potentially coming to Westeros and mm -hmm. <laughs> marrying mermaids and stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> potentially yeah. even before hey. the first man got there. I mean, it's, I'm really trying to figure out like, just how if weird a chat here. What'd if William Shatner taught us anything, green women are hot. They are. <laughs> Lady Sununas, that's what I was saying. And the same applies for green men. They're hot. <laughs> Bougie Panda, you're kind of killing me with all comments that have nothing to do with this stream. Um, could you please rate it in for me a little bit? Thanks. Um, just all over the place. Yeah, please. Um so these green men, they, they're coming. What I'm trying to figure out is, did they get here first? Like, did Garth lead the first men? Or is there a time when there's green men in Westeros that are like uh, uh, doing other stuff? If the people that came from the Great Empire of the Dawn, like, were they just green men um, when they weren't Valerians? So they just, we just... It's just, it opens up a lot of things here, but I guess what I'm trying to say is Lang is part of the Great Empire of the Dawn, and if the Old Ones are green men, then we literally have green men involved with the Great Empire of the Dawn. Like, it's right there. Then the, mm -hmm. the Empresses of Lang are called the God Empresses, and Bloodstone Emperor supposedly married a tiger woman, and Lang is strongly associated with tigers. And a tiger woman could be obviously somebody whose skin changes animals. And we also think of the children of the forest having cat eyes. So the large golden eyes of the Langi, it doesn't say if they have got the slitted irises of cats, but they could, or it could be they lost that part of the trait because obviously they're not straight old ones. They're part human as well. But the actual old ones, they're going to have big golden eyes and yeah mm -hmm. they like Catwoman, that bloodstone emperor married is probably a god empress of the langi who might be some sort of human animal hybrid if she's related to the to the green men so that gives like i i don't know how closely the children and the green men are related but the point is like the green men might be a very large part of the Great Empire of the Dawn. At least a very large presence in the Great Empire of the Dawn. And so the idea that some of these ancient mariners might have brought green men or have been green men is completely on the table. Right, Tim? Back me up here. Yeah, and I think a good example is Euron and his crew, actually, because Euron's crew is made up of all different people because Euron, despite being Ironborn, and despite how xenophobic the Ironborn are, he's actually been all over the world, if we take him at his word. 
but his crew is is people of all different races. Well, we had talked earlier, you had mentioned like the idea of Europeans coming to the Americas and you have Brits and people from Spain and people from the Netherlands and all that stuff. They're all different people, but they are all still European. Well, with the great empire, something that vast, that big, that would have been a multiracial, multi-ethnic, and if what we're saying is true, multi-species empire. So when we say people are coming over from the great empire of the dawn, they're not all the same skin color. They're not all the same, you know, race or ethnicity. They can't be, yeah. An empire, yeah, an empire that huge, the explorers that are coming over, the sailors and their crews that are coming over, they would have been from all different places, all different walks of life. So what you have coming to Westeros is all different kinds of people and humanoid creatures, apparently. And that's why we get such, that's why you get such a, a diversity with the races like squishers and children and giants and green men and regular humans with altering different, you know, different skin colors and different religions and all this. It really is like a, it's multiple different eth ethnicities. It's just that they're all under this great big umbrella term of great empire. And I think that's the thing that we got to get at. Same, same thing with the Valyrians and what House of the Dragon is trying to establish by having House Valyrian be black is, you know, we think Valyrians and the mind goes to silver haired and purple eyed. But again, no, that would have just been one people living in an empire. An empire is vast. There's going to be many, many, many different kinds of people of all varying skin colors and things like that same applies for the great empire and like that's what we're getting across so whoever came from the great empire they would have been they would have been coming from all over it's you can't just think this is just one group that they, and they all look alike and they all think alike and they all talk alike and they all believe the same thing just because they're from the same place that's just not possible when the place they're coming from is that huge Yeah, I, I've made this point over and over, and I'm going to make it a lot in my f upcoming videos. But yeah, like, uh, it they're going to look all different coming from the Great mm -hmm. Empire. And it's it's so old and magical that we should, you know, expect probably some very high fantasy stuff. Um, but the yeah. main thing is that we don't have to speculate. Once we put together this idea that the old ones are green men then we know there are green men inside the empire of the great empire of the dawn. And then all that tiger woman stuff and the God Empress title mm -hmm. really suggests that the bloodstone emperor is having something to do with Lang. So I don't know why they have to come to Westeros if they've got green men over in Lang, but maybe that's where the best meteor fell, or maybe there is something unique about Westeros. Uh, and then they had to come there. We'll have to find out at the end of the story. Right. Well, I think it's uh, it's what leads to Azor Ahai and what leads to Bloodstone Emperor. Now, maybe they're the same person, maybe they're not, but it's power. It's power hoarding. That's what I think is driving them. It's And that is, that's always been the, dr the drive for exploration has usually been for power and resources. Again, like, George writes his story. He writes his people as people. So even though this is a fantasy story, they are not above human means. Same thing with the gods, too, as we've established here. Relore, Cthulhu, Zeus, they're greedy, they're capricious, they're self-entitled, they're self-serving. These are all very human aspects applied on a godlike level. And it permeates throughout human through humans. And there's nothing to say that giants and green men and children don't have those same qualities to them as well i know we like to and i think that's the, that's the uh problem with viewing the children sometimes as like oh they can do no wrong it's like no they could they could probably be just as flawed as humanity was there's nothing stating that they aren't that just because they're some kind of magical creature that that somehow puts them above all of this i don't believe that yeah, and the the thing about the green men is that they, again, I just want to open up this idea that they might be different than the children of the forest and not just nature elves, but rather 
like the first yeah. humanoids that are doing stuff like sailing and trading and enslaving others and stuff like that. I just, it's a sort of a slow realization that they came on me as like, oh, we're, we might be kind of missing it, you know? Anyway, um, let's see here. Okay, so this one here, by the way, this image, which I do love as well. This is by Timu Huso. This is a druid, three-eyed druid. Here's some more druids. The one on the left is Chris Kinter, and the one on the right is Artist Unknown. <clears throat> so, do the green men have something to do with the others? You bet they do. Could the green men be the product of a union between the children of the forest and the first men? No, I think it's the other way around. Like, first men might be the union of children of the forest and green men, <laughs> if anything. Because um, the green men are taller, for sure. But to get back to Mariah's question, um, yeah, so the others are the exiled hive mind of the original Weird Net. The original Green Seers. I think, I don't know, I think they were probably all green men. I, I just, I think it's so weird that the children need human Green Seers. And I know there are children of the forest on the older Weirwood thrones in that cave, but I just, mm -hmm. I don't know, man. I think the idea that Garth planted Weirwoods, I just see the green men as like, and the green men are the one on the Isle of Faces watching over those Weirwoods. Their role with the Weirwoods is more like, I see the children of the forest as like the custodians. They're like the caretakers. The green men are the weirwoods. Like they're the same thing. They're the avatar of the weirwood. So I really can't <laughs> wait to see the Isle of Faces. Um, but yeah, essentially, yeah, those original green seer spirits that were made into others were green men. And if you want to go to my Night's Watch theory is that there was originally a, an order of green men watching over the Weirwood at the Night's Watch, and that Azor High slash Night's King or whomever literally sacrificed green men along with Nissa Nissa in like a blood magic ritual. And that's part of the creation of the others and the invasion of the Weirwood yeah. and all that stuff. I mean, as to the question of why do the children need human green seers, it seems to be because they know that they're dying out. Leaf says as much like the sun is setting on our time. We were small in number. We were never really numerous to begin with. And it seems like uh, they there's that the idea of complexity in nature. It's why um, it's why insects, which are more simpler creatures, can breed so much so fast and why humans uh take like nine months to gestate. Now humans are kind of the exception to the rule that proves it true because we're at 8 billion. Elephants are a better example because elephants are pregnant for over a year. But the, it's the idea of complexity. The more complex a creature is, the longer it takes to gestate. And that seems to be the reason why the children are so few in number and why they were never numerous to begin with. But they've accepted that, hey, our time is over. Like we can't, we can't get back to our old numbers and they were never that many. So the best we can do is give it to you and give you what we have left. I think that's the, th the, the thing they're doing. Yeah. I do think it could make sense just as if, um, you know, it's like, oh, well, they're few in number. So that, you know, the odds of getting a green CR is just simply low. Um, so they need yeah. humans, but it could be that ever since humans invaded the weirwood net, they need a human green seer as well. So there could be something like that going on. Now, um, okay, so one of the things that I noticed is that all of these Azor High parallel figures are stag men in some way. Uh, Stannis being the most obvious example. He has Lightbringer and is named Azor High, and he's literally a Baratheon with a stag sigil. And I'll put up some... Some Baratheon artwork here. This is the Baratheon sigil. Here's Stannis's sigil. 
So it's like Azor High with antlers, right? Okay. Now, Barak mm-hmm. is an Azor High parallel figure. He's sitting in a weirwood throne. So, Green Seer. Jon Snow is an Azor High character. He has a, he's a skin changer, and his wolf looks like a weirwood tree. And he's going to go inside his wolf, like Azor going into the weirwood net. Um, he's also called out as a corn king. And the corn king archetype is based on Kernunos and the green man and all that stuff. So, that implies Jon as a green man as well. <clears throat> and there's more, uh, um, but uh, let's just start with Stannis and the Baratheons. And so I've always wondered about this, like, is Azor High, is he implied as having antlers because he goes into the weirwood net? And like I said, if you go into the weirwood net, you're wearing the tree now, like a headdress, like Bran was a second ago. So maybe that's why Stannis is a stag man and Barak is in the Weirwood Cave, and John's a skin changer, going to go into his wolf. It's all about Azor High breaking into the Weirwood Net. But, but, there's also the possibility that he was actually some sort of horned figure to begin with. There's a couple ideas here. So, dragons have horns, just like goats and, you know, stags and things. Um, the Baphomet which seems to be a part of the occult inspiration for some of this stuff. He has demonic dragon-like figures, but also uh, goat features as well. Um, all the, the Satan imagery is, is developed from the green man and from an antler or a goat horned figure. Okay. So there is this crossover of like demons and dragons and like, you know, the green man and horned, Horn, like, you know, Kernunos types. There is a folkloric crossover there. So that is what I began looking at when I'm looking at Stannis. But now, now it's like, okay, well, if the old ones were a part of the great empire of the dawn, and if the old ones and the green men are potentially like they are in Lovecraft and they travel and sail ships and stuff, now we have to look at, well, who was Bloodstone Emperor? Was he a human? Did he look Valerian? Or was he some sort of weird, freakish, horny humanoid? And so these questions have always been lingering in my mind. And Tim mm-hmm. is going to introduce now somebody called the King in Yellow, which is a major inspiration oh. for Euron, Azor High, as well as all these Baratheons. And it's going to tie some of these together, ideas together in a very satisfying way that may explain how Azor High is a kind of stag man. But uh, take it away, and I'll scroll to your king in yellow. And I'll, I, yeah. get the, I get the art ready, too. Sure. Yeah, so the question you're raising, it is a hard one, because figures like Azor High, the Bloodstone Emperor, they're not ones that we have any official artwork yet. George is yet to commission that. I mean, we're getting a Grey King in the new calendar uh, with a Green Mermaid in the background. And I think the fact that George personally has these commissions says a lot, because that's how he's expounding ideas that he hasn't got to in the books, is with the artwork he commissions. It'd be great if we get a, like an a, official Bloodstone Emperor or an official Azor Ahai, huh. but I'm sure he's he, yeah. he's keeping that purposely. He's keeping us purposely in the dark on that. Playing games with my heart over here. I know to show to show us if we would ever have official artwork of them, that would just get, it would give away the entire game. It's never going to happen. That's why we speculate the way we do. So, the King in Yellow. So okay, King in Yellow is a story by Robert W. Chambers. Um, and Lovecraft adapts this and yep, King and Yellow. And I actually have my copy of, I have that one here, the global classics, which is the King in Yellow depicted as a stag man. And those are some beautiful, beautiful antlers. <laughs> That's a prize buck right there. <laughs> Indeed. Anyway, so, <laughs> so King and Yellow, this is all adaptations from Ambrose Bierce and Robert W. Chambers. It starts with Haisha the Shepherd and an inhabitant of Carcosa. Uh, Chambers adapts from that and creates the King in Yellow and makes Carcosa his setting. And then Lovecraft took Carcosa, names like Carcosa and Hastor, 
and the king in yellow, and he throws them into his story. Um, actually, in Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, the king in yellow appears as the high priest not to be named, who is wearing a silken mask and yellow robes. Um, in fact, if you actually if you check out my channel, I did a whole thing, the Stream Quest of Unknown Kadath, mm -hmm. where I really broke down the entire story and and showed all the parallels that George was drawing, like the Cavern of Flame and stuff like that. So if you really if you want an in depth thing about Kadath, how Kadath features into a Song of Ice and Fire, check out Stream Quest on my channel. Anyway. So George draws upon on that because he throws in his own Carcosa out in the Far East. And I think the placement of it is very deliberate because he puts it as the very last thing on the map before it cuts off. And this is to highlight it as this legendary city from Chambers that sits on the peripheries of reality and, and, uh, and dream world. I've said I think the Far East is George's ode to the dreamlands. And he places it in the Shadowlands. It's right where the Mountains of the Morn open, and it sits on the Hidden Sea. So it is literally sitting where the world ends and where the shadows begin. Now, in Lovecraft, and especially in Durlith, who was the benefactor of Lovecraft's estate, he went hog wild with the King in Yellow stuff. And he put Shantox and Bayaki out in Carcosa, and those are Lovecraft's dragons. So that's another thing that's drawing upon the idea of are there dragons out in the Shadowlands? Well, yeah, if if you go to the literal things that George is drawing from, from Lovecraft and Durlith, they have dragons in Carcosa and George put his Carcosa out in the same area. So it, it, it's it's he's building more of that mystery, but leaving us little little clues to say, like, yeah, this could be maybe, maybe not. But here's here's a clue. You make of it what you will. Now, for Chambers' part, when he created the King in Yellow, his inspiration for the King in Yellow was actually Dionysus from Greek myth. And George draws upon all of that. So Dionysus is a god of winemaking, uh, fertility, festivity, insanity, ritual madness, religious ecstasy, and theater. And with our King in Yellow figures in A Song of Ice and Fire, we actually get two through two houses the Baratheons and the Greyjoys. And the, I've said many times, the sigils tell a story all their own because the Baratheon sigil is, I mean, yeah. Um, I got it right here. Dragon. Yeah, I got mine over there. But yeah, the, uh, the stag, the stag, a black stag on a field of yellow. And then the Greyjoy sigil is a yellow kraken on a field of black. Black and yellow are the two main colors associated with the king in yellow. And both yeah, and just, of these I mean, families... Just, are... Real quick, just look at this. Mm -hmm. That's Robert. And here's the king in yellow. So, I mean, <laughs> it just really comes yeah, through so, there. <laughs> so, Robert, Renly, Stannis, and Euron are all king in yellow figures based on their sigils and based on these uh, different... Uh, these different aspects of Dionysus. Now, with the Baratheon brothers, it's split up. Robert, he's got the fertility, the festivity, and the wine on lockdown. Okay, because <laughs> he's having, he's got bastards all over the place. He's a summer king, a solar king. That's all his shtick. Renly, more festivity, but also theater. Uh, the whole Knights of Summer, the Rainbow Guard, the tourney that he's doing. It's all pure pageantry. He is our theater. And then Stannis. Stannis brings in our ideas of religious, ex of our ritual madness and religious ecstasy. And that is through his association with Melisandre and the Reloris cult. Now, on yeah, the other hand, we some, invert. Yeah, we've got, I'll just flash some Stannis art while you're talking, but we're all familiar with with Mel, this mm -hmm. is Bella Bergholtz, Catherine Dinger, Magali Villanueva, uh, or Villeneuve, sorry, and this is Oust and Jack Kaiser. And so, yeah, this was really interesting how you explained this to me. Like, the attributes of the King in Yellow are split. Basically, take it this way, guys: if you put Renly, Stannis, and Euron, uh, Renly, Stannis, and Robert together you kind of get Euron if you sprinkle bad intent on top of it all. But like 
Euron is youthful and glib and charismatic like Renly. He's debaucherous and lecherous like Robert. Um, and he's violent like Robert. And then, of course, Stannis brings in this sort of occult, um, uh, ritualistic side as well. And also, like, Stannis is doing some pretty evil shit. I mean, he's burning people. R'hllor is very demonic. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I never thought about that. But that is pretty interesting uh, to think about the way that those personalities are split out there. So, just real quick, uh, somebody in the chat pointed out that, of course... And you've mentioned this a million times, but the uh, the 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 rule of Yi Ti is contested by somebody mm -hmm. out in Carcosa who calls himself the 69th Yellow Emperor and claims to descend mm -hmm. from Chai Duke. Chai Duke being the one who kept a dragon uh, and uh, at his court and married a Valerian noblewoman. And I've pointed out, like, oh, yeah. what was what was he trying to do? Like, he was trying to do a great empire of the dawn throwback thing there for sure. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's basically George telling us yellow emperor He's saying, Oh, the 69th yellow emperor out in Carcosa. Like that's the king in yellow. Exactly. So, yeah. Cause what it, the, cause what the king in yellow is, is it's, it's not a full book. It's a collection of short stories and each short story represents a different theme of the king in yellow. And those themes are the same thing that are all the things that Dionysus had domain over because Chambers was drawing from Dionysus. Um, so in Yi T, the, yeah, the rule is contested by three emperors. There's the Azor emperor, who is the real, who's supposed to be the one in charge. There's the orange emperor, who is a breakaway, who is a general who has basically launched his own coup and established his own capital. And then there is the Yellow Sorcerer Lord out in Carcosa. And this is all romance of the three kingdoms. The Azor Emperor represents the dying Qing dynasty. The Orange Emperor represents the breakaway generals and warlords who start establishing their own petty kingdoms during the Chinese warlord period. And the Yellow Sorcerer, he represents the Yellow Turbans and the Yellow Turban Rebellion. So, yeah, Romance of the Three Kingdoms. George is drawing all of that. Same thing with it. He even does the, the Treaty of the Peach Garden with uh, the Nine Penny Kings and the Blackfire Rebellions. That's a whole that's a whole other can of worms. But, yeah, and as to everyone else who keeps bringing up uh, True Detective, yes, I am very familiar with True Detective. And, uh, yes, the, the sacrifice. The sacri yep. Before we go off onto a tangent, I'm sorry. Um <laughs> this art I got from you. Somebody in the chat is saying the one on the left is AI generated. I don't think that's the case. Um, where did you get this? Uh, the artist's name was Mid Journey. Okay, so everybody that's can calm they, down then what... in the chat, please. Thank you. Jesus Christ, dude. All right. Um, yeah, and this doesn't look like AI art either. Like, I don't know why someone would think that. Like, this is obviously painted. Yeah, the two, the artwork that I got, so yeah, that one's the book, that one's Global Classics book cover, that's by Mid Journey, and then the other one that you had up that had him, both with the stag horns and the tentacles, uh, that is by, the artist's name was Alex Reynolds, I believe. There you go. Alex something, I don't have the name right here. But, Mid Journey uh, is yeah. an AI? Mid Journey is an AI. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Damn, oh, I thought that was funny. just someone's username. <laughs> oh, joke's on you. Oh, damn. God, AI sucks. Wow, that's sneaky. Because people, you know, some artists don't use their real names. They use, like, their their online handle. So I just figured Midjourney was someone's username. Well, that's a, that's a damn. pretty good image. So somebody coaxed something good out of it. Of course, this is made oh. from stolen artwork. We don't know what real artwork went into feeding the mid journey algorithm to make this that is very depressing god egg take on it my off face. okay my bad my bad i i take responsibility for that i thought mid journey was someone's user handle <laughs> but see but that's the thing um mm -hmm. like yeah like <laughs> this is why is like if when you when you get a good one it's because it vacuumed up a bunch of good artist work 
downtown Clanny Brown's actually been an AI this whole time. Well, I mean, if you want to chat, if an AI wants to chat in the chat, that's fine. We'll have to watch those comments though. Um, but no, but that's uh, it. Like this, the apparent skill uh, that's in that image comes from artists uh, whose names we don't know and who didn't get credit. And that's why this is a slippery slope because the AI uh, art gets put out into the fandom and then it circulates with the regular art. And unless you're very, very careful, you can end up accidentally showing AI art on your stream. So, yes. all right, that's, yeah, I take, I'm gonna have to be more discerning with my artworks. Now I'm gonna have to track down and be like, oh, hey, are you Tim, a Tim, it's person? an honest mistake. <laughs> I didn't know that Mid Journey yeah. was the name of an AI. I would have done the same yeah, thing. No. I would have been like, oh, because the artist handles that people have are fucking all over the place, right? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I'm almost glad this happened because this kind of makes an example of why I, I say that we need to resist AI art across the board and not use it at all. It's because any amount of letting it into our fandom spaces and it all gets mixed together. And then you have these, then you can't tell. You can't even tell <laughs> in some cases because that was a good one. Most of the AI, AI art is easy to spot. You're like, oh, that's AI art. This is a good one. That's disappointing. It yeah. totally fooled me. Well, the other and, one, and you knew it was going to get better anyway. It's like only a matter of time before <laughs> it gets to the point where it, it fucking fools you every time, right? Well, because it didn't need to draw hands in that one. It didn't need to draw hands. <laughs> Rhaenyra <laughs> of the Nine Fingers. <laughs> uh anyway oh yeah, yeah this one has hands so this one's more trustworthy this is trust the artist gave a first no hands yeah i can't trust it no hands <laughs> hands <laughs> only use artwork oh, man. Hand, where hands are visible <laughs> okay so bringing this back okay, on track so let's get back on so the point okay, okay. So back on track. Let, let me interject something here if Euron is a king in yellow figure and Robert the Usurper is a king in yellow figure, then that means, and, and if Stannis is part of this king in yellow, Stannis is the most king in yellow out of any of the three Baratheons, frankly. And if you look at the Stannis artwork, like, look at this. Hang on. Yeah, well, the king in yellow is a usurper. In the story. <laughs> and that's that's Robert's title, right. Um, Stannis is also... <laughs> well, he's a king contesting for the throne, but... Point is, <laughs> this opens up the idea that Azor High is a king in yellow figure. So, would that yeah. make sense to you? Like, what's the Azor High king in yellow parallels? Well, the Bloodstone Emperor is a usurper. He, he usurps his sister. So if we're thinking Azor Ahai and Bloodstone, it, I think it, it comes down to whether do you think the Bloodstone Emperor and Azor Ahai are the same person or are they two separate people? But either way, whether they're the same or whether they're separate, they both have strong, strong parallels. Right. Again, Bloodstone literally usurps, just like Robert usurps, just like the King in Yellow usurps the throne of Carcosa, the city of Memorable in the play. Um, so yeah, so... It's it's the now it's the question of usurpation by Azor Ahai, but that comes probably with the killing of Nissa Nissa. Uh, this is a guy who's power hungry. He's obviously he's looking for he's looking for power greater than him, and if he's willing to kill his wife, then he, that just shows that he's not above sacrificing other people to get his means. And that means Azor Ahai is a stag man. Good night. Go home. Don't use AI art. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Azor Ahai. Yeah, Azor Ahai. It's right in there. Didn't even see that. <laughs> Damn it. Damn it. I think we just, I think we just, um, we passed uh, mid journey on the touring test just now. I think it's now a human, Tim, because of what we just did. <laughs> sorry i'm still chuckling about that and apologies to the person in the chat who i told to settle down you were right 
<laughs> Thanks for raising a ruckus. Okay, so point is, yes, like you could see how this comes together. There could be a reason why all these Azor High figures have Green Seer and Stagman imagery, and it might have to do with more than him just breaking into the Weirwood Net, but rather that these Great Empire of the Dawn people, some of them, or maybe just the usurping Bloodstone Emperor, were like horny people. They were, in some extent, you know, maybe they're wearing headdresses or whatever, but like, the symbolism is very repetitive on that. And so then, again, yeah. it gets back to this whole idea of Lang and these old ones and these green men. Where did Garth come from? It's disturbing, man. I mean, like, look, Uthor of the High Tower marries a daughter of Garth. Uthor is the first High Tower whose name we have. Now, he built the fifth tower, so he's not the first one there. But it says the first High Towers killed the dragons that were roosting on the Fused Stone Fortress. And then, so he's like, if he's marrying a daughter of Garth, I'm just saying like, Garth and the first High Towers are there at the same time. And Garth is in the Reach, like, which is very close to Old Town. So I just, I'm really wondering about how the green men got to Westeros, like I said. And what's going on here? As yeah. far as like, did they come to Westeros to get access to these weirwoods? Is there something unique about the weirwoods? Was it because the meteor fell in Westeros? Because remember, it says Bloodstone Emperor worshipped a meteor. It could have been the one he found here. I don't know. Well, I'm thinking, like, if we go back to Melisandre saying that the wall is a hinge of the world and that she feels like she's more powerful at the wall than she, even more than she felt in a shy. Maybe Weirwoods, if they're connected to Shade of the Evening Trees, maybe they discover, if, if what they had were shade trees out in the east and they find, hey, these Weirwood things, these are similar to our shade trees, but better in the way that the wall is like a shy, but better. Maybe that becomes the thing. Oh, yeah. Maybe the shade trees are messed up. Maybe that's why. They, maybe it's like, oh, their weirwoods got messed up and turned into shade trees and they had to go to Westeros to use those. Could be. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Uh, you, th you think that morphine's great. Wait till you try this heroin. Like, that's the thing. Like, it could be like that kind of jump. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to see. We'll have to see. I, I think that when the story ends, we'll be able to draw some more parallels to the Dawn Age stuff and put some of it together. Um, Andy, again, is pointing out that weirs are for catching fish. Are the weirwoods for keeping out or catching the deep ones? Well, that gets back to one of the other questions I had, which is... We keep, you know, Grey King and Durn God's Grief are both marrying mermaids. Um, and then the Maze Makers are wiped out by the Selkies, and the Maze Makers might be. Oh, I guess we should talk about the Green Men. Um, or the Maze Makers, because the Maze Makers are super tall as well, and they're making subterranean cities. So the best parallel to them really is the Old Ones, who are also tall and make subterranean cities. Um, the maze makers were wiped out by Selkies. So if the if the maze makers were old ones or green men, then that could be interesting because it's that same pattern. Yeah, but and the maze the makers are also. Go ahead. Oh, the maze makers are also huge in Laura and Lorath's history, and then Lorath has. After they die out, the next inhabitants of Lorath now have that blind god religion where they feel that. They cut off their sight so that they can open their third eye. So it becomes a, a more of a connection of yeah, maze maker to a green seer style idea. So that's the par that would be another parallel that George is drawing. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that because that is an obvious weirwood parallel. And our only Lorathi character 
is Jock and Hagar, who's a weirwood and a faceless man. So no, the blind the blind followers of Boash came after the Maze Makers. They're not the same people. <clears throat> At least that we know of. Yeah, the people who currently inhabit Lorath, the mazes <clears throat> were already there when they got there. So could could the Grey King have been Well, I guess let me just ask you, like, do you think the green men that are in Westeros did come from Lang, or do you think they were just here on their own? No, I think they came from Lang. I think the native, if we want to say like what the native inhabitants of Westeros are, I think it's uh, children and giants. And then squishers just kind of be wherever because they're ocean, they're an oceanic creature. So they have the means. That's why they pop up everywhere is because they're traveling across the ocean. And I think the, yeah, the green men probably came later. They're probably the first more humanoid, more humanoid than the children of the forest and the giants, at least until, and, and this becomes our stepping stones until we get to, you know, quote unquote, normal humans, as we would see them. This seems to be like, I don't know if this is George's idea of evolution or not, but that seems to make the most sense to me. Yeah, I, I really think so too. I, I'm, I'm starting to lean that way. Because, like I said, the idea of the green men leading the first men over the land bridge, I just don't think it's right. I don't think there are green men on the other side of that. And I think the first men probably just migrate over on their own because people wander and migrate. Like, that sounds like a very mm -hmm. normal human migration. And I think that, yeah, I think that the green men were probably in... Well, here's the thing. If the green men came to Westeros, maybe there's like interesting weirwood history here. Like that might have been some part of change of what's going on with the weirwoods because originally there's only children of the forest in Westeros. And then these green men are coming from Lang and becoming the green men that watch over the weirwoods. So the weirwoods do seem altered, obviously. Um, mm hmm. And then we also have to wonder about the oaken seat. Garth the Green supposedly made a living tree thrown out of oak. I'm just confusing myself. <laughs> well, that could be like the green men come over and they meet with the children and the children are like, oh, hey, you know, it could, it could, be, a, it could be an exchange like, hey, these are weirwoods and this is what we would do with them. And the green men could be like, oh, hey, we kind of do a similar thing back home. And it just becomes like, hey, we can use this, but we use it in a different way. And that might mm. be where the face carving comes in. If that's not mm. an original child, since that's seemingly not an original children thing, but that could be an aspect of green men being like, hey, well, we can put this to our okay. use. We just have to make a slight alteration. Yeah, because we see the stone faces in the rainwood. So that like the face carving thing might be something they can do in different mediums but it's more effective mm -hmm. when you do it in a weirwood. And that does make sense. Okay, so this starts to fit together of why Azor High is invading the weirwood net. Like, he is a horned person, and he's coming to Westeros. He's finding a, a different kind of tree here and applying magic that he already knows how to use from the Great Empire of the Dawn, and then something new is happening. That kind of makes sense. Um, real quick, a super chat. Uh, all the violence, George showing its acceptability. That's kind of vague. I'm not sure what you're getting at. Um, history is very violent. I'm not sure which violence you're referring to, though. Uh, violence is never acceptable. I think Ice and Fire makes that pretty clear. So I'm not sure where you're going with that if you want to follow up and elaborate. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so Talk Studios is bringing up that the first Yi T Emperor after the launch. So after the break up the Great Empire, when Yi T becomes the successor, the first emperors are the Gray Emperors. Married to Langi God Empress, he would control the fleets, but I don't know if he did marry a Langi God Empress. Hmm. 
That, that is interesting that the first the first emperor after the long night is the gray emperor. Yeah, because so. all those all those uh Yeetish emperors are symbolism. Like we we've, we've found a few things that are interesting. Um Oh, and also when we go back the Isle of Faces and the Isle of Lang have some obvious parallels being islands where they both uh kill lots of people, commit the blood magic there. Mm -hmm. And they're both uh, you know, hostile to foreigners like the isle of faces you can't even get there unless they want you to get there and if you go to lang you might die uh so yeah they're both one thing whole. i've noticed one thing i brought up with the et emperors is the naming conventions and how it harkens back to the great empire because the great empire we get things like the pearl the jade the tourmaline the onyx emperor and then with et we get gray sea green scarlet they're like col they're doing colors but they're not as vibrant because they're not gemstones like the Ye like the great empire emperor titles were so they are literally pale comparisons <laughs> which means which is a way of saying Yi T is trying to be the successor to the great empire but they're not making it there they they don't have the same land the same territory that the great empire had they're trying so they are a pale comparison yeah, but you can definitely see them trying. Exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, gosh, is there anything else that we want to get to? Well, we were talking, we didn't get to the King in Yellow and, and the Euron stuff. I don't know, but, I mean, I've talked about that before, but I could give a, another rundown on it. Oh, uh, let's see, where are we here? Um Because we were talking about, about it in House Baratheon. We didn't talk about House Greyjoy. Yeah, well, okay, so, yeah, take it away on that. And people have noticed the inverted sigil colors. And then I've pointed out the Grey King during God's Grief parallels. So there do seem to be connections. And they both worship, you know, wind and sea gods and all that. And then Merry Mermaids. So very similar. Sure. Go ahead, though. Okay, so if you want to bring back that artwork I had of the, the good one from the actual human, uh -huh. um, there... <laughs> because they cover both aspects. So up top, we see the staghorns, but at the bottom, uh, we can see the tentacles. Now this is, again, this is once we get the adaptations away from Chambers in the original story, where the King in Yellow is more of a stagman figure, when he gets incorporated into Lovecraft. Because of course, when something gets adapted into Lovecraft, you add tentacles to it. That's just how things go. For Lovecraft's purposes, the King in Yellow becomes a character in his story, and he becomes the avatar of the god Hastur. And Lovecraft didn't write too much about Hastur. It was really Durleth, his benefactor, the benefactor of his estate, who really went ham with this stuff. But Hastur is a brother of Cthulhu, and he is a, so he is another great old one, another Kraken god but he is a god of cosmic wind. And this is where we get the adaptations that George is using with the Ironborn mythology because the drowned god is a avatar, is his version of Cthulhu, but the drowned god fights against the storm god. Well, here we have. So in, in Lovecraft, the storm god Hastur wars against his brother Cthulhu, who is the drowned god in the sunken sea of Ryla. And then Euron becomes that because Euron is a brother of Balon Greyjoy, Balon the Crack, and Balon is the Kraken at this point. Then Victarion and Aaron are the other Krakens. But here is their bad brother who is representing the Storm God. So he's representing the enemy of their religion. Yeah, he says, but, I am the Storm, and he, he sacrifices to control the wind. Yeah, definitely. But he is still Greyjoy, just in the way that Hastor, even though he wars against Cthulhu, they're brothers. They're still of the same family. And then with these aspects of Dionysus, how the Baratheons have it all broke, have it between them, but all broken up, Euron checks all of the boxes because he's a showman. The theater is right there in his king's moot. And again, at the uh, when they take the Shield Islands, he he's a. He's a philanderer. He, he's a charlatan, but he is a theater. He represents the aspect of what the Ironborn think the ideal Ironborn man should be. But at the same time, Euron is a rejection of all of that. 
because of how worldly he is and because of how he rejects their own religion in favor of himself becoming a god that is the hastor element it's it's being opposed to all of that yet still being associated with it because you're still part of this family and it's really interesting that um the king in yellow is becoming an avatar for this being hastor who's an old one because mm -hmm. we're talking about bloodstone emperor worshiping a meteorite which might have an alien intelligence and you're on potentially getting body snatched by the great other or some sort of entity azor high the mm -hmm. original thing so we see that theme essentially being implied in ice and fire it's like ah uh, these if you're not careful you might end up the vessel for some god trying to incarnate and euron is the main one who we've been looking at and he's modeled off mm -hmm. a character who becomes an avatar for hastur the old one who is a storm yeah. god figure such as you see on the screen so and that's why i've said like many a time i think euron's logical end is that He's going to unseal something, but it's not going to work the way you want it. It's going to overtake him, just as I see that Azor Ahai did. He got what he wanted in the end, but it's not the way he envisioned it. Probably over whatever it was he was trying to get overtook him. That seems like the, the ending for both of them. Yep, they're preaching in the choir here. Yeah. Uh, devoted to Mariah, the people from the shadow who taught Valerians how to tame dragons. That's just the great empire of the taunt. There's not different people in the Shadowlands beyond a shy. That's all part of, I mean, there's lots of people, but that's, that's the great empire of yeah. the dawn. It's not a different answer. I mean, at that point, when, when you get to that point, you're just breaking up it. You're breaking it up into regions like, oh, they're from the great empire. Yeah. But they're yeah, from I mean, this specific right. part of the great. That's like saying, well, yeah, I'm I'm from Pennsylvania and you live in California, but we're still Americans. Like now, now, now you're just you're, you're taking something big and trying to break it up into even smaller pieces. Yeah. Which the point is, is that the, there are some dragon riding yeah. people who look like Valerians in the great empire of the dawn. And those would be the ancestors of the Valerians. That's really. Oh, you guys were talking mm -hmm. about something different. OK, never mind. Very good. Well, let's see here. Um, so what does this imply? It implies that, yeah, just what you said, Euron's end is potentially to get body snatched by something. And we think that that could happen to John's body for a time as well. So there's a couple different mm -hmm. vehicles for this sort of thing to happen. And yeah, I mean... When they talk about Knight, Knight's King being the 13th member, like a member of this Green Man Watch that killed these other Green Men and did an evil ritual, it's like, look on the screen here. Like, that's him. Like, that's the kind of dude we're talking about. So there is an archetype that is um, a precedent. There's a couple of things that could be a precedent for Azor High as some sort of stag man. And it almost certainly would have something to do with those langi so yeah one way or the other i think you have old ones from lang coming to westeros mm -hmm. <clears throat> um there was so the super chat from earlier in the stream that you said to hold till later it was asking our favorite something but i don't remember what it was so repeat the question scotty if you would denise asks i want to know why there are two disparate theories on the 13th lord commander Killing green men or sacrificing the children born to the female other who are called brothers of Craster's line. Oh, because you need both. It's You need babies and green man spirits. The sacrificed babies would be to create the, the physical bodies because those green man spirits are just spirits and they need an icy golem body to live in. I believe that's what's going on, but... However you want to break it up, it seems like it's two parts of the puzzle. Because we're exiling, we're exiling, um, yeah, the green men's spirits, like they're just spirits, but they need to have an ice body. And so you need some physical mojo to make that. And so when, the, when Craster's giving his sons to the others, I think they're actually just using those babies to sustain the spells that allow them to have bodies. 
I don't think they're turning those babies into new White Walkers myself. Um, what if the shade trees are the originals? Um, no way to know. I mean, maybe. Uh, but yeah. the symbolism of the shade of the evening tree lines up with the other eyes idea of a weirwood. And that would be a transformed version. So, But yeah, hey guys, if you've appreciated the program, you want to support the program, then PayPal will be awesome. There is a link below the stream. Thank you, Karstark. I always uh, forget to mention all the things. There's Patreon as well you can join and you can also use a super thanks inside of youtube and make sure you're subscribed to grayways tim mm -hmm. and i think that's pretty much what we yeah, came here to person. say more or less yeah. um i'm going to keep developing these ideas a little further as we continue our exploration but i never even thought about the gray king being you know one of these old ones from lang and he very well could be and that could honestly explain a lot of stuff. Why not green men from the Ifakevron forest? Because we never hear about them. Maybe the children did the hammer to separate the weirwoods from the contaminated shade trees. No, but there's... No. Sorry, this is the end of the stream. I'm tired. I can't, like... I can't even take that on right now. But, like, yeah. See... You can't just say maybe this or maybe that. Because, like, I'm... All of my theories are following, like, long lines of reason and stuff yeah. so like there's a lot of clues that the children didn't do it so when you just say well maybe they did do it like i don't know how to answer that they didn't i don't know i don't think they did anyway for all the reasons i've said so i mean my problem with that, that theory is that there's no shade trees close enough by for that to be an option now if shade because the only time we hear shade trees is in karth but karth is nowhere near westeros Anywhere. And, it's, and, it's, and there's it's, none anywhere. It's only inside the Garden yeah. of the Undying. There's not any anywhere else that we hear of. And there could be some, but it seems yeah. like those shade trees are something unique that the warlocks have almost engineered or something. Like, they're weird. Right? Yeah. Like, if there were if there were shade trees growing in, like, Lys or Tyrosh or Mir, something that was near the Narrow Sea, near where the Arm of Dorne used to be, that would make it a better that would make it a better idea because that would meet that would show like oh yeah we got to put some distance between us break that arm here's here's our separation but they're not they're so far out and so far away from where the arm of dorn was i don't see how they could be how severing a connection now i get that trees in the root systems can send signals to let others know that tree other trees are sick you know unravel your roots but the, tr the yeah, but again, the only shade trees we know growing are in Karth. They're too far away from where the Arm of Dorne was for weirwoods in Westeros to be able to pick up a signal like that. They would have to be cl growing closer. Now, if we ever, that's something, again, it's one of those unknown unknowns. We need more information on shade trees. Where do they grow naturally? How close? But it's not. Now, I will say, though, if we ever get a description of a shade tree with a face carved into it, that's going to confirm a lot of this green men stuff because that would be further confirmation of face carving is them adapting their own magic to weirwoods. So I tend to think that, like I was saying, magical technology is always pliable. So if you can carve faces in heart trees, you can probably carve faces in other kinds of trees. I just think weirwoods are the best for it. Um, the uh, wildlings mm. do carve faces in other kinds of trees that seems more of a cargo cult thing because I don't know that there's necessarily any green seers traveling with them to use those trees, but potentially, yeah, just, just like you can use the runes on different kinds of metal and in different languages. If face magic is, a th I mean, that's what, that's the point of seeing the faces in the stone in the rainwood is George showing us like the face magic can be used in different mediums. So, there's no reason why you couldn't carve a face into an undying tree. The The question is, yeah, those shade trees, like, do they come from Olthos? Like, Olthos looks dark on the map. Is that a shade forest? Mm -hmm. Do they come from Mossavi? We don't yeah, know. Like, if you were to tell me that shade trees were growing in the in Kohor, which is, you know, our basically our, our satanic place, I'd believe that, too. 
and that would at least put it a little reasonably closer to Westeros. But even Kohor is still pretty far. It's the furthest east of the Free City. So that's still a lot of distance. Yep. Yep, it is. It is. Um, and that's why, like, it's been so long. It's been 10,000 years or so. Like, so, like, a lot of these places... <laughs> George is trying to show us like most of these things have died out. Like the Ifakevron, it's just a surviving pocket of children. It's just to tell you that the children used to be everywhere. And if the children used to be everywhere, well, aren't they kind of, doesn't their whole existence revolve around magic trees? So it implies that there are magic trees in the forest of the Ifakevron of some kind and potentially other places in the world. Oh. oh, Scotty was asking, what is our favorite A Song of Ice and Fire theory to date? And was why? that the one to hold to the end? Yeah. I'll let okay. you go first. What is y'all's favorite A Song of Ice and Fire? To date? Well, I, I think the my, my favorite is the Euron is going to get body snatched idea. Because, again, I've talked so much about how Euron is George's Lovecraft character and that that is always the fate of Lovecraft characters. They always get overtaken, steamrolled by something. The only one to really have a happy ending is, is uh, Randolph Carter in Dream Quest. And that's just because he forces himself asleep. I mean, forces himself awake and gets out of the dreamlands. Like the bare minimum happy ending is he didn't die at the end. So yeah, you're on getting body snatched and becoming the plan B night. That's what I call him. The plan B night's King after when John doesn't work out for them. That's my favorite. And that, and of course that Euron's going to steal the Sarion and there's going to be a, a John Euron dragon battle mimicking Damon and Aemon one eye. <clears throat> and speaking of night's King dragons, um, I got a PayPal question here from Jacob. And he is saying that Viserion dying and being whited seems like maybe it wasn't entirely made up. I also agree with that. So he's wondering, maybe if Vermax from, you know, Jace and the Pact of Ice and Fire laid a clutch of eggs under Winterfell, which we've talked about, and that that is that becomes the undead dragon. But it would have to it would have had to have hatched a while ago, is the problem with that. It's the same reason with the Winterfell dragon, like was it living under the crypts all that time and no one ever heard it or like caught, found any dragon poop or dragon stink? Like, it's not very realistic. Um, there, so if there's another dragon that's going to show up besides Danny's three, it would be a literal ice dragon from the north, from the heart of winter. That would be the most likely answer. Some people think cannibals still out there. I don't really think so. Um, I think that a real ice dragon could appear. That could happen. But probably it will actually be Viserion. Because it's like, look, Euron is going to steal Viserion, or try to, and Euron also might become a Night King. So you can see how these things will come together. Uh, and then real quick, super chat from Tracy. Where is Euron getting his shade of the evening? Uh, from this, he captured warlocks on a trading mm -hmm. cog and... They had a cask of it. He says that, actually. Yeah, he plundered a warlock ship. Yeah, and then he starts... Then he brings them onto his ships. He's, ha he's got them tied to the prows, but before that, he's he cuts off the legs of one and force-feeds him to the others, and that's the one that's screaming, Pray! Pray! Nice. That's nice. I think that, that's in the Forsaken. Yeah, I do think there's a decent chance we'll get an ice dragon. Um, I'm not maybe as positive about it as I used to be, but it could happen. So, Alrighty. Well, I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up, Tim, because I did stay up until about 6 last night recording the first Ironborn video and then decompressing afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Um, I missed uh, yeah, a super chat from No Sage about green men plus squishers equals humans is essentially aquatic ape theory. Um, kind of. And I'm a fan of aquatic ape theory. That's a fun little one. Um, 
Not a fan isn't. I think it's true. It just I think it's interesting. Uh, I think I, I think if we've established anything here, it's that you're on his plan B, Night's King, and humanity is all the result of a giant primordial species orgy. Squishers, green men, children, giants, everyone just getting down with one another. <laughs> Grey King and Dern God's Grief are both green seers who marry mermaids. So I don't know what's going on there, but I do think, I wonder if the deep ones want to capture and breed with skin changers. Can you think of a reason why they might want that, Tim? Deep ones and skin changers. I mean, are they? Just, they could just be farming whoever's there. Okay. Yeah, I mean, because in that, see, that's an interesting whole idea, a whole new idea. Because green seers is not something that's come from Lovecraft. Because the Lovecraft idea is that the deep ones just need humans to breed. That hybrids are just a way of just continuing their numbers, continuing their pop, their population. As for George, though. Squish, what would squishers have to gain from breeding with green seers? That's yeah, because whole, like the far winds, the <laughs> they might be walrus people, or maybe they skin change walruses. So it's like, uh, is there, mm -hmm. is that originally how deep ones were able to breed with humans? Is they needed skin changers for that to even work? I don't think so because a thousand islands people, it seems like they're all fished out. Um, yeah. I mean, the other thing about deep ones is that when they're not farming humans, what's the other thing that they're usually doing? They're usually doing the bidding of Cthulhu, protecting his children or trying to break him out and wake him up. So if there was an idea of what would squishers want with what with green seers, it would probably be something akin to that. Green seers being something that could help them in their end goal of trying to break out their own God. But again, that's something George has said, we're never going to see literal gods on page. We're only just going to feel their presence, just like a, just a little, a hand just kind of coming through the ether every now and then, but that's about it. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Um, yeah, I'm just like I'm just following the the lines here. It's like Grey King is a skin changer and a green seer and he's marrying a mermaid, Dern God's grief, green seer, marrying a mermaid. So then they both had tons of children and those children became entire nations and regions of people. So it's kind of telling you like humans are descended from green ones, green men and deep ones. Or Something. I don't know, man. It's some weird shit going on, like you said, in ancient Westeros. Yeah. Just a lot of interspecies sex. <laughs> Could it be possible that the others have already whited sheep stealer or cannibal, and that's what Bran saw in his vision that changed his mind? Asked Jobby. That's an interesting idea. I don't think so. But that's kind of a cool idea. They've already got a dragon. Just chilling. I think it'll either be a Viserion or an Ice Dragon, but we'll see. Well, it'll be one or the other for sure. All right, Tim. Well, thanks for helping me out here, man. Um, I'm hoping to clarify some of this in my Grey King video, uh, but it'll probably just end up saying, and maybe he was a green man. Who knows? Uh, so <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. But uh, the comments on this video should be interesting. That's for sure. So thanks, everybody, who sent in PayPals and Super Chats and who watched the video. We had good attendance today, over 500 most of the way. So very cool. Appreciate that. And uh, I will see you again soon with another stream. Subscribe to Grey Waste Tim. Make sure you subscribe to this channel. And uh, that's it. Cheers. Happy Sunday. Good night.